Welcome back, everyone. Today, I'll be recapping a new manhwa called The Male Lead Was Stolen by Extra. But before we dive in, I have a small request. Only 20% of the viewers who watch our videos actually subscribe to our channel. So please consider subscribing. Your support truly motivates us to keep moving forward and bring you more exciting recaps. Let's get started. The manhwa opens with a girl waking up in her bed. She notices a man standing in front of her who announces that he fell in love with Grace, so he wants to break his engagement with her as soon as possible. What? This is just the beginning of the storyline. A major flashpoint already? Anyway, the girl you're seeing in front of your screen is our main character, named Salonia. She's the fiancé of Ian Cherville and the only daughter of Duke Beeson. Salonia agreed to Ian's proposal of breaking off the engagement, and Ian mentions on how he doesn't want to inform her about this when she just woke up, however he told her because he wants to hurry up with his marriage with Grace. Ugh, I'm already started to hate this fucker. Salonia seems puzzled by all this and wonders if she heard everything correctly. Breaking off the engagement? And so suddenly on that too? She wonders who this Grace is and what on earth happened during the month she was asleep. We then get to know that our main character entered the novel, Surviving the Demon King, about nine months ago and has been living as Salonia ever since. The novel is an ordinary romantic fantasy story about defeating the devil. Salonia Bethan, whom our main character possesses, is one of the Empire's few healers and the female protagonist of the novel. Her fiancé, Ian Cherville, serves as the male protagonist, and their relationship is portrayed as stagnant, lacking any particular affection. However, when the Demon King is suddenly resurrected during an ordinary date between Salonia and Ian, the Empire forms an elite unit to subdue the Demon King. Ian, as the leader of the Imperial Palace's monk and fire knight, and Salonia, as the healer willing to join for the sake of peace, become crucial members of this unit. Other key members include the paladin Rayev Hetzel and another male protagonist, Meg Ryan, who has inherited dragon blood. In the original storyline, both Rayev and Ryan loved the female lead, Salonia. However, during the demon extermination, Salonia and Ian realized their true love for each other, leaving Rayev and Ryan to watch without being able to intervene romantically. Instead, they dedicated themselves to helping Salonia, wanting her to be happy. The four heroes joined forces to defeat the Demon King, and afterward, the female lead and the male lead pledged their love and got married just as the novel was supposed to end. However, there's a twist in the tale. On the way home one day, our main character falls ill for unknown reasons and spends the next three months in bed. And upon waking up, she learns from her fiancé that he wants to break off their engagement. Ian then informs Salonia not to worry as alimony will be paid and advises her to finish it quickly. Salonia sighs upon hearing this and mentions how she participated in something dangerous like a lynch mob immediately after being possessed, relying on Ian for distinction to get her through the tough times. Even though he wasn't her real fiancé, she never thought her relationship with him would end like this. Upon noticing her silence, Ian questions Salonia if she's going to drag it on like this. Salonia clenches her hands and thinks about how it really seems like the person she is has been completely erased from him. She then agrees to break off the engagement with him. She reflects on how it wasn't originally her plan, but Ian was a man who demands to break off the engagement with her fiancé, who just came back from the dead without even asking how she is doing. She definitely doesn't want that kind of relationship. Salonia then tells Ian that she will receive whatever alimony she wants, so he should wait until she asks. She thinks about how she won't let him go so easily since he betrayed her, she plans to take away the most precious things from him. Upon hearing Ian mentions how he doesn't know she's this greedy, and Salonia responds that it's his ignorance that he doesn't know anything. Ian then inquires if he can at least leave a pledge, and Salonia is annoyed by his tone, as it seems that he has no intention of respecting her until the end. She can't believe she trusted a scumbag like him, and how the times they spent together as they passed through life and death seem meaningless now. However, she realizes it's good she found out about all this sooner because people like him won't have any influence on her life anymore. Ian then signs the pledge and throws the document towards Salonia, asking if she's satisfied now. 
Salonia questions herself what satisfaction is, as the time she spent with him was organized with just one piece of paper. As Ian begins to leave, Salonia asks him to wait for a moment. Ian questions her what else she wants, and Salonia just smiles, thinking about how she can't let him go like this. She extends her hand and tells him to come closer. Ian thinks maybe she wants to have a last handshake with him. As he extends his hand towards her, she quickly gets up from her bed and punches him straight in the face. That's my girl. Shocked and confused, Ian questions her why she did that, and Salonia responds by mentioning that he has done enough and she deserves to hit him. She asks him if he's going to take out his anger on her for something like this. As Ian is about to say something, he decides not to. Before leaving, he tells her she doesn't have to come to his wedding, and Salonia responds by telling him to lock the door before leaving, as she won't be seeing him off. Once alone, Salonia clenches her fist in annoyance, as for the first time she thought that she could have a family. Before entering the novel, she lived alone without parents or friends, falling ill and dying at an early age. Since she had no body to return to, she decided to continue her new life as Salonia. She liked this place where she had family, friends, a fiancé, and lovers who loved her. Now, realizing she no longer has a fiancé, she decides not to dwell on the past. She believes it's okay if she doesn't have a fiancé, as her precious friends are still by her side. They shared their lives on the front lines with her, crossing the line between life and death. Aside from being the sub-male protagonist of the original work, Salonia believes they are irreplaceable people who are precious to her. A few days ago, Salonia was enjoying her tea time with Rayev when she suddenly coughed. She inquired about what he said just now, and Rayev informed her that he wants to follow Ian's fiance, Grace Bennett, and make the knightly oath to her. Well, looks like knighty oath means nothing, but honestly speaking, it's a good thing when douchebags are leaving in the first chapter. Anyway, Salonia was shocked upon hearing this and wonders who the hell this Grace really is. Salonia was silent for a while, then suddenly pinched her cheeks, wondering if she's in a dream. However, she soon realizes that all of this is not a dream, and Rayev questions her if she's all right. Salonia thinks about how she doesn't really have feelings for Ian to begin with. It doesn't matter that he's a kind and gentle protagonist. Our main character and Salonia are separate individuals. On the contrary, she's been mentally accepting that they left her because she's not the real Salonia. She mentions how the time they spent together must not have been created for nothing. Ian questions her about what she just said, and Salonia replies that it's nothing, realizing that she said it too loudly. Salonia finds it truly disappointing, but she realizes there's no reason for her to get angry just because Rayev revoked the oath of the night he pledged to her. Salonia wonders if she should tell Rayev the truth, as he's her friend. She then reveals that Grace Bennett will soon become Ian's fiance. Rayev is silent upon hearing this, and Salonia remarks on how it must be shocking for him, and moreover, being taken away by Ian again must have been a great disappointment. However, Rayev tells her that he already knows that Grace is Ian's fiance. Salonia is shocked upon hearing this and asks him if he really knows everything, to which he replies in the affirmative. Rayev explains that he can't stop his feelings for Grace, and it's fine for him to watch her from behind as he just wants to serve her. Salonia is taken aback upon hearing this and realizes that it's exactly the same as the confession he made to her before. Salonia didn't feel betrayed by this, as it's Rayev's choice, no matter who he chooses. Moreover, unlike Ian, Rayev's change of heart isn't just a passing fancy. Rayev is the first friend she made since she possessed this body, and for him to confess his feelings like this, and knowing they won't be able to see each other privately from now on, she can't help but feel upset. Rayev then apologizes to Salonia, however. Salonia reassures him that there's nothing for him to apologize for, as he has his own free will. However, no matter how much she thinks about the situation, she didn't know how they both ended up falling for Grace's affection. She wonders if it's really just a simple coincidence, and she knows asking Rayev about this would be futile. She then thanks him for everything he did for her until now, and hopes that he will find happiness in his life. She then extends her hand for a handshake. As they both shake hands, Rayev tells her to take care and stay healthy, and Salonia tells him the same. Rayev then bowed to her and left, and Salonia thinks about how it seems like the connection with Rayev has come to an end. 
she suddenly falls into her chair and realizes that something must have really happened during the time she was in a coma. Ever since she was suddenly possessed until defeating the Demon King and returning to the Empire, she's sure that she followed the original story, and the deviation from the original story started during the journey back after defeating the Demon King when she suddenly fell into a coma. She wandered through life for a whole three months without knowing what was happening, and during those three months, the male protagonist fell in love with one woman and betrayed her. A thought suddenly came into her mind, and she remembers that there's still one male protagonist left. Just then, that very male protagonist, Ryan, arrived and called Salonia. She wonders why he came to her now of all times. Ryan then informs Salonia that he wants the dragon's heart back, as he wants to give it to someone else. Salonia smiles upon hearing this, as she had already expected something like this. She mentions how he once said that the heart would protect her for a lifetime, and now he wants it back as if it was something to return. Salonia then questions Ryan if the person he's talking about wanting to give the dragon's heart to is Grace Bennett. Ryan was shocked by this and questions her about how she knew, to which Salonia just coughs as she realizes that all the male protagonists have fallen in love with a character who didn't even appear in the original work. We then see a scene of a past. During the demon extermination, Salonia found herself tumbling off a cliff, questioning the futility of her impending demise. Suddenly, Ryan emerged, morphing into a dragon to thwart her imminent death. After rescuing her, Ryan approached Salonia, incredulously questioning her reckless climb up the perilous cliff. Salonia explained her pursuit of the elusive Silkia flower, renowned for its potent healing properties and cherished by adventurers. Though the original Salonia had retrieved the flower without any issue, she collapsed when she stepped on it. Ryan, realizing his initial anger was misplaced, apologized to Salonia, acknowledging the frailty of human life compared to his own transcendent nature. He then presented his dragon heart, a potent artifact capable of safeguarding its owner at all costs, despite knowing that relinquishing it would significantly diminish his own power. Salonia hesitated, aware that accepting the heart would weaken Ryan, but he reassured her that prolonging their time together was worth any sacrifice. Satisfied, she accepted it. However, in the present, Ryan was requesting the return of his dragon heart, intending to bestow it upon Grace. You know, unless all these idiots were mind-controlled, they deserve to stay on the streets. Ryan then questions her on how she knew about Grace and further asks if it's true that she was sick for three months. Salonia responds by asking if that's the first thing he says to someone who just woke up, shocking Ryan. She advises him to follow her, as she'll give him his heart back. Oh, Ryan asks if she really means it, to which Salonia tells him she can understand what he's going through. Salonia then calls her maid, Ella, and instructs her to bring her the jewelry box from the safe. Ryan questions her if she won't ask why he's doing this. Salonia responds by asking why she would ask anything. However, in reality, she wants her ask, but she's scared of the truth being revealed, and all their past actions were just a shell to proceed, as in the original novel. Ryan then questions Salonia if his heart has been kept in the safe all this time. Salonia replied in the affirmative, explaining that she can't lose it as it's precious to her. Ryan was shocked upon hearing this, and as he was about to say something to her, Ella suddenly arrived holding the jewelry box. Salonia then thanks Ryan for always protecting her. She gave him the box and tells him to be safe from now on, to which he simply replied with a yes. As Ryan left her room, Salonia sighed, and Ella mentioned how she must be really upset. Salonia replied by telling Ella to imagine if she made a dish with the ingredients she had to work hard to find, even risking her life, and suddenly, out of nowhere, someone just ate it all up. Upon hearing this, Ella inquired if Salonia was angry, to which Salonia replied in the positive. She continued by telling Ella that she's not just upset, she's furious as well. She was dragged into a subjugation squad as soon as she was possessed, and due to this, she had no human relationships other than her colleagues. Salonia explained how she had to work hard in a hellish place, and when she finally had a family she could rely on, someone just came and turned her efforts upside down. She thinks about how she can't let this matter go so easily. Salonia suddenly gets up and instructs Ella to ask for the finest guild for information on Grace Bennett and to find out if she's had any noticeable behavior recently or if her speech or behavior has suddenly changed.
Later, Ella helps Salonia get ready and asks her if she's feeling all right. Salonia asks for more clarification, and Ella explains that she didn't seem to have any energy lately. We learn that when Salonia fell asleep a little while ago, she had a dream about coming out to defeat the demon. On the day when it rained heavily and hiking was difficult, she was walking a little behind and suddenly lost her balance and fell on the muddy dirt. When she fell, all three of them, Ian, Riev, and Ryan, held out their hands to help her. No matter who gave their hand first, she took Ian's hand, of course, as he was her fiancé. They held hands and walked together. At that time, she felt Rayev and Ryan behind her as they bitterly withdrew their hands. She thought that she couldn't reciprocate their feelings, so she didn't give them any room and didn't look back. However, in the present, she didn't have anyone by her side whom she could rely on. Salonia responds to Ella that she's all right. She just had an old dream. She then inquires to Ella about her father's whereabouts, and Ella reveals that the Duke was worried about her so much that he even started to cry when she skipped dinner last night as he prepared a delicious meal for her. Upon hearing this, Salonia chuckled awkwardly as her father is way too overprotective towards her. We learn about Salonia's father, the Duke of Galloway, Bethine. It's said that he poured all his love into his daughter after the death of his beloved wife. He's a loving father who cares for and loves his family deeply. By the time our main character was possessed, the real Salonia had already decided to join the subjugation group, but her father tried to dissuade her. However, like any parent, he couldn't beat his own child's stubbornness, and in the end, Salonia followed her own will. When she returned, her daughter had lost consciousness and wouldn't wake up. From what our main character heard from Ella, her father had visited famous doctors, healers, and priests all over the country, but he was in despair when he saw his daughter who didn't wake up. After waiting for several months, Salonia finally woke up and found herself in a world she had never been in before. It was the first time she felt her father's love. She reflects on how she gets scolded even if she skips a meal once a day. Recently, when she was sleeping, Ella arrived to wake her up and informed her that the Duke said he'd starve when he knew she hadn't had dinner. Ruby was shocked upon hearing this and quickly went down to have her meal. With a proud expression, she thinks about how her father can do anything when it comes to his daughter. Salonia realizes that no wonder her father had such a reaction after hearing Ian's atrocities. When her father heard Ian had requested to break off the engagement, he immediately grabbed his sword and tried to attack Duke Cherville's residence, only calming down after the entire family came forward to stop him. In the first place, this engagement was Salonia's grandfather's decision. In other words, it was a contract marriage written by the previous duke. Bathan is a golden family with enormous wealth that exceeds the imperial treasury, and Sherville, a historic family that dominates the political world. It was a serious marriage that even the emperor had to be wary of. Ella then informs Salonia that her makeup is complete, and as she looked at her reflection in the mirror, she realizes that she indeed has quite the protagonist-like appearance. Despite lying down for several months, there's hardly any muscle loss, all thanks to her father for providing expensive magical potions every day. Later, as Salonia sits to have lunch with her father, he mentions how he heard that she requested information about that woman from the finest guild, to which Salonia also agreed. The Duke then questions Salonia if she still has lingering feelings for that scoundrel Ian, to which she angrily replied in the negative. She thinks about how it's expected when she commissioned Phoenix. They contacted her father. Phoenix is the largest information guild in the Flanagan Kingdom, following the Vesson family's motto. It was established during the founding of the family and has been overseeing the Vesson family ever since. Salonia then tells the Duke that she used the guild because she has something she needs to confirm. The Duke asked for clarification, and Salonia informs him that somehow Rayev and Ryan also developed feelings for Lady Bennet. It's a coincidental and fitting timing, so she was just curious and wanted to find out the cause of all this. The change of heart from friends who she thought were her true allies. Now it has become something she can't overlook. If their feelings towards her were only for the sake of progressing the original plot, she wonders what about her sincere and wholehearted efforts. Salonia believes that if Grace seems suspicious, it's definitely because of her influence that they changed. However, if she's not, it might be that people's feelings change. 
she just wants to confirm that all this isn't her fault in any way. Salonia then reassures her father not to worry about her, as whatever is happening, she'll know everything soon, as she believes that there must be a reason, something that she missed. Meanwhile, the scene then shifts to Ian, who tells someone that she did well by finishing the work quickly, as they can go on a date a day earlier now. He then questions the person if she liked the scenery, and we get to know that that person is none other than Grace Bennett. As they both sat in the garden, Ian questioned Grace if there was somewhere she would like to go. Grace revealed that she wanted to go to the desert shop recommended by ladies this time, named Roblanc. Ian was taken aback upon hearing this and realized that it's the same dessert shop Salonia likes the most. He told her that place is a bit remote and not well known, and suggested they go to the newly opened Breguel instead, as he heard their interior is very luxurious and beautiful. Undeterred, Grace persisted, stating that she really wants to go to Roblanc. However, Ian told her that Roblanc is a bit far and advised her to head somewhere closer today. Just then, Grace's expression turned cold and she asked him if he used to go to Roblanc with Salonia, mentioning how this might be the reason he doesn't want to go there with her as he's worried it will bring back memories with Salonia. Ian replied, stating that's not what he's trying to say. She then suddenly turned and started to leave, mentioning how it seems she still can't find a way to intervene. Ian tried to stop her, stating that it's a misunderstanding, the distance is too far, and he was just concerned that she might find it difficult. He then told her that they can go to Roblanc if she wants, also assuring her that someone like Salonia is not in his mind at all. Grace stopped and inquired if he really meant it, to which Ian replied positively, stating that she's the only one for him, and Salonia is now completely irrelevant to him. Grace smiled upon hearing this and told him that she believes him. Ian then instructed a servant to go and fetch the carriage quickly as they are going to Roblanc right now, and Grace smiled like a classic manwa female villainess who acts all innocent and weak. Ooh, what an ugly bitch. Meanwhile, in the Empire, the news of Salonia and Ian's breakup spread like wildfire, portraying Lady Salonia as struggling with the pain of a broken engagement. Salonia also saw the news article and found it ridiculous. Struggling with the pain of a broken engagement was laughable for her, as she had been through all kinds of hardships in the nine months since transmigrating. But now that she's experiencing the life of a lady for the first time, she's incredibly happy. In the original work, the realistic hardships of the adventure journey were often left unexpressed, like sleeping on the dirt floor with the whole body covered in dust, showering in open cold waters, and days of making a meal with stale, moldy bread. Salonia thinks about how, no matter how bad her situation is, why would she struggle with the pain of a broken engagement when she's finally experiencing the life of a lady for the first time? She decides to enjoy her life to the fullest and walk the flower path from now on. Just then, an unexpected news arrived. Ella informed Salonia that the Emperor hosted a congratulatory event, the victory ceremony, after defeating the Demon King. An imperial victory ceremony was held for the savior hosted by the Emperor, and naturally, Ian, Rayev, and Ryan all attended that ceremony. But due to unknown reasons, our main character had fainted and couldn't participate. Salonia realizes that the Emperor had considered her inability to participate in the victory ceremony, and Ella responds, stating that of course they would consider, since Salonia is someone special. Annoyed, Ella questions Salonia if she had seen the nonsense they were babbling about in the newspaper, writing anything without properly verifying the facts. Ella mentions how, since Salonia has been quiet for a while, it seems the publishers are getting bolder. Ella then advises Salonia to expose them all, and Salonia just chuckled upon hearing this, finding Ella's caring nature cute. While she was using recovery as an excuse to stay at home, Ella went undercover and toured the kingdom's newspaper companies. While doing things like that, she kept Salonia informed about the external situation. Recently, the hottest topic in society is undoubtedly the savior who defeated the Demon King. Among them, the attention is particularly focused on the breakup between her and Ian. Hmm, people do love gossip, no matter which world. Salonia then questions Ella on how the request from the morning turned out, to which she replied that she had already sent the letter. Salonia sent the letter to Ian as it's about time she received the alimony. She believes that once he receives the letter, 
He'll probably come rushing after all. She asked for something very important to him. Just then, another servant arrived and informed Salonia that the Phoenix Guild leader had arrived. Salonia was taken aback by the sudden arrival, as it hasn't even been a day yet. She wonders if it's because of his father's influence that they are gathering information quickly. She instructed the servant to let him in. The guildmaster, Jillian, then gave Salonia the information she requested about Grace. As she read the report, she was shocked by its contents and asked Jillian if this information is true, to which Jillian replied in the positive. The report contains just a single sheet of paper, and Salonia wonders if this is all the information about Grace. She then asked Jillian if there's a misunderstanding, as she requested all the information about Grace, to which Jillian replied that as she can see, that's all there is. Salonia sighs upon hearing this. She thinks about how she hadn't expected to find the whole truth of everything, but she thought she could at least get some clues about Grace. She realized that she could easily find this amount of information without the Guild's help. Jillian then tells Salonia that the only noteworthy aspect is that Grace had frequent interactions with three men in the three months after the victory ceremony. However, all of those interactions were initiated by the men towards her. Salonia thinks about how she'd already seen that in the document as well. Grace's first encounter with the three men was at the victory ceremony. Although they had no prior contact or meeting, the four of them had a chance conversation, and in the end, they didn't leave Grace's side. During the week of the victory ceremony, they gradually fell for her. Jillian then gives Salonia the list of participants in the victory ceremony, and as Salonia goes through the list, she didn't find anything unusual. She wonders if the cause is not Grace after all, or if it's just a change of heart on their part. She questions herself what was the point of all this, and further wonders if she just wanted to find something from this. Now she really knows nothing of what she should do. Later, Ella approaches Salonia and advises they head out for a change of mood in the afternoon. However, Salonia just stays silent, and Ella realizes that Salonia seems really out of sorts and depressed. Maybe it's because that they couldn't find anything is the reason that her mood isn't improving. Meanwhile, Salonia thinks to herself about how she hadn't expected to find out the truth like this, not being able to catch even a small clue. Ella then tells Salonia that it's been a long time since they went to Roblon and had something delicious. Salonia suddenly halts in her place upon hearing something delicious. She realizes that she doesn't have time to be upset like this. She tells Ella to head to Roblon right now, to which Ella happily obliges. A few hours later, as Salonia and Ella arrived at Roblanc, they were both taken aback to find Rayev there. Salonia questions him about his presence, but Rayev seems hesitant to divulge anything. Salonia wonders why he is making that kind of expression, as if he has seen someone he shouldn't have here. Rayev then asks Salonia if she came to buy a cake, to which Salonia replied in the affirmative. She then asked him why he is here, but he didn't say anything. Salonia thinks that Rayev is probably not entirely comfortable either. However, she feels something strange, as Rayev usually maintains a gentlemanly demeanor and won't typically act like this in front of anyone. As Salonia moves to enter the bakery, Rayev suddenly stops her and tells her that it would be better if she didn't go inside the bakery. He explains that the dessert she wants to buy is already sold out. Salonia understands everything and tells him that he's still pretty bad at lying. Rayev averts his gaze upon hearing this, and Salonia thinks about how he has a habit of avoiding eye contact when lying, and even in this situation, he does the same. She suddenly remembers what he told her previously about protecting Grace. She then mentions to him how it seems that Lady Grace is inside the shop. Rayev flinches upon hearing this, and judging by his reaction, Salonia realizes that she's correct. Grace is indeed inside the shop. Ella then questions Salonia if she can pick up the cake for her, to which Salonia tells her that she'll eat it here. As Salonia starts to move, she wonders why she should avoid anyone, as she hadn't done anything wrong. If the two of them can't be together with her in one place, they should be the ones to avoid her, as besides, Grace was the one who actually stole her fiancé in the first place. Moreover, she's really tired of hearing that name repeatedly and also wants to see her in person. Just as Salonia extends her hand to open the bakery door, someone opens it from inside, and that person turns out to be Grace, 
who arrogantly smirks at Salonia. Ugh, how dare she? The audacity of this bitch. Grace then mentions how she never expected them to run into each other in a place like this. She then tells Salonia that she has been wanting to meet her for so long, and Salonia thinks about how she's even more shameless than she thought. The scene then shifts to the battlefield, where Ian was fighting a demon. After successfully killing the demon, Salonia approaches Ian and asks if he's all right, to which he replies in the affirmative. He asks her if she's hurt anywhere, and Salonia responds stating that she's fine too, since he watched over her. Ian then extends his hands towards her cheeks and expresses his desire to go to Roblanc together when they safely return, to which Salonia happily agrees. In the present, Grace questions Salonia if she also came to buy desserts. Salonia thinks about how Grace seems to be pretending to be close to her by calling her by her name. She's even more shameless. Salonia then questions her who she is, as it seems like she knows her. Salonia continues by questioning Grace on, wouldn't it be more courteous for her to introduce herself first? Grace then introduces herself to Salonia as Grace Bennett, the daughter of the Marquis Bennett. She also apologizes to her if she has caused any inconvenience to her. She states that since Lady Salonia is the savior who defeated the Demon King, she guessed she mistakenly thought they knew each other without realizing it. Salonia thinks about how it was mentioned in the original novel that the four saviors will be forever together with trust and affection for each other. But now she's all alone. Salonia then mentions how she didn't become a savior for the fame, which causes Grace to flinch. Just then, Rayev intervenes, telling Salonia that she's going too far with her words. Even if Grace made a mistake, there's no reason to say such things. Salonia is shocked upon hearing this and thinks that it's surprising how much his attitude can change. Just then, Ian steps out from the bakery and questions Grace why she's still here. He suddenly notices Salonia and calls her. Salonia, agitated, thinks about how it's just as she suspected. The two of them came together after all. She wonders why Ian brought Grace to Roblanc of all places, knowing better than anyone that it's her favorite place. Grace then suddenly hides behind Ian, and Ian questions Salonia about what she did. Salonia replies that she did nothing. Grace intervenes, stating that it's just a misunderstanding. She explains that she just greeted Salonia because she was happy to see her. Even if Salonia doesn't like her, there's nothing she can do about it. Upon hearing this, Ian advises Grace not to defend Salonia, as whatever happened doesn't matter to him. He then tells Salonia not to be rude towards her fiancé. Salonia wonders why she searched for reasons for so long. Their relationship should have ended long ago, clinging to an unreturnable past like a fool, wondering if she did something different from the original, or if something else influenced their relationship. She realizes she was the only one holding on to such things. Ian then advises Salonia that it would be better if they didn't attract attention to each other for each other's sakes. As Ian and Grace began to leave, Salonia tells Ian that it was him who actually needs to straighten up. Ian is shocked upon hearing this. Salonia questions him about how dare he shamelessly wander around here and asks if his face is that thick that he can be this shameless. Ian, taken aback, questions her what she's talking about. Salonia responds by stating that she knew he was someone who doesn't feel shame and questions if there aren't many watchful eyes here. She continues by asking if he's proudly showing off that he cheated on her. Ian flinches upon hearing this and has nothing to say anymore. Grace then tells Ian to leave this place quickly. Yep, you better get lost. As Ian began to leave, he mentions that he knows Salonia is shameless, but to this extent, as all of them are leaving, Salonia suddenly notices a dragon and realizes that it's Ryan. She wonders if he had been waiting for Grace. Grace then turns and informs Salonia that she and Ian are soon to be engaged. Salonia realizes that she's trying to provoke her. She questions Grace what she is trying to say, to which Grace smirks and tells Salonia not to feel too bad about it, as they both look quite similar. Salonia is shocked upon hearing this and wonders what did she mean. As Salonia watches everyone leaving with Grace, she realizes that the protagonist of the novel is now Grace. She admits that their connection was insignificant and everything has changed, but she's still thankful to Grace for not letting her cling to this relationship anymore. Later, we see Rayev standing alone, holding a paper in his hand. Just then, 
Ryan approaches him from behind and asks him if he knew this would happen when he made the choice, to which Rayev replies in the positive. He mentions how even though their situation has changed, it's the same as it was back then. The news of Ian and Grace's engagement spreads quickly throughout the Empire. Rayev thinks that knowing that they love each other, even though he has accepted that, he still wants to stay by her side. However, he wonders why he feels so lonely. He met Grace at the victory ceremony, and her clear appearance shook his heart. He thought this time around he could change, maybe it would be different from Salonia, but he realizes that it's the same this time as well. Ian was with Grace, and in the end, he's just a friend who can only watch them. Nothing has changed from his time with Salonia, yet he can't stop his feelings for Grace. He doesn't know how it all started, but his heart was taken in an instant, getting used to not receiving reciprocation, just watching from a distance and finding satisfaction in being by her side. He questions if he made a mistake by stepping back from the knight's oath without thinking. Ryan then questions Rayev about why he regrets so much if he changed his heart in the first place. Hmm, look who's talking. Rayev responds by stating that he also took back the heart he gave to Salonia. He questions why he gave it if he was going to take it away anyway. Ryan is shocked upon hearing this. Rayev further questions him if what he's showing now is his true sincerity. Ryan responds that he did his best back then just to save Salonia. If it wasn't for him, she would have already died. Upon hearing this, Rayev shouts at him and mentions how he never thought he'd take the heart away from Salonia, even after protecting her until the end. He questions if it doesn't matter now if Salonia gets hurt. As Ryan is about to say something, he suddenly feels a pang in his head and remembers Salonia's face. He wonders what this feeling is. But before he could contemplate further, our wannabe protagonist calls him to have lunch with her, to which the guy also agrees. As he moves towards her, Rayev thinks about how Ryan seems confused, and he wonders what he's so confused about. But before he could also contemplate any further, our wannabe protagonist calls him as well to have lunch, and this guy also obliges like a puppy, pushing aside other thoughts and telling himself that the one he loves is Grace Bennett. Meanwhile, Salonia was seen writing something. She thinks on how the original story have already ended, whether it was a happy ending or a sad one. In the novel, after defeating the Demon King, it concludes with the wedding of Salonia and Ian. At this point, she has already surpassed the completion point of the original, and there's no predetermined story beyond that. With this, she wonders if she's now the owner of this body. Suddenly, she overhears two ladies talking about her. One of them questions how the Marquis's daughter managed to surpass Lady Vassane, and Ella becomes enraged upon hearing this. Salonia tries to calm down Ella, stating that she's really fine. Salonia reflects on how, as Grace announced the engagement as promised, it was only natural for public attention to focus on her. But she has already sorted out her feelings. In the beginning, it wasn't easy to shake off lingering attachments, but she doesn't want to waste this given life being swept away by useless emotions. Ella then questions Salonia about when she will be returning to the healing clinic. All the excitement Salonia had suddenly vanished as she realizes that, in the original novel, Salonia is highly regarded as an imperial healer and worked at the healing clinic. However, she was assigned the Demon King subjugation and then fell ill for unknown reasons, leading to a lengthy leave of absence. Salonia tells Ella that there are still six months left in the leave of absence. She'll finish that time first and then return to work because now she just wants to spend her remaining time at ease. Ella responds by stating that it's a good idea, advising Salonia to do everything she wants until then. Salonia happily agrees, believing there won't be any worries anymore. As night falls, one of the maids expresses concern that Lady Salonia doesn't seem like herself lately. She questions another maid if they have also noticed it, feeling like she's been completely reborn, rarely getting angry or irritated anymore. Another maid wonders why she's suddenly changed so much, noting that it seems to have started around the time of the Demon King's subjugation. She ponders if it's related to that risky task, considering Salonia was unconscious for three months after the subjugation. Sometimes people change when they wake up after being near death. Salonia overhears everything and realizes the maids are talking about the original Salonia before she was possessed. She wonders if the female lead was like that in the original story, 
realizing this is a conversation that needs to be taken into account. In the present, some ladies approach Salonia and greet her, but she notices their tense expressions. She wonders if she's making everyone uncomfortable. Chatting with Ella, she suggests the ladies sit together since it seems like there isn't enough space. A few days ago, she overheard some of the maids conversing, and it seems like the original Salonia had quite a personality. However, Salonia realizes that from now on, the person living as Salonia will be her, so she needs to build the right image. Salonia then happily invites the ladies to have lunch with her. It's been a long time since she left society, so there aren't many young ladies to interact with. The ladies seem hesitant at first, but in the end, they graciously accept Salonia's offer. The unexpected meeting turned into quite a long conversation, and by the time Salonia learned about the ladies, their conversation had shifted to Ian. Yeah, very typical. One of the ladies named Abel mentioned how she heard about the engagement of Marquis Cherville and Grace Bennett. Abel asked Salonia if she was hurt by the news, to which Salonia assured her that she's fine. Abel stated that it's fortunate that she's okay, and questioned how there could be a person like Grace, who followed someone who's already engaged. She mentioned that Grace's family seems to lack dignity and is a disgrace for the nobility. Salonia suddenly intervened, stating that she believes whether it's a man who cheats or a woman who meets such a man, it's both their fault. Salonia wasn't feeling too bad, as there were newspapers that beautifully announced the engagement news of Ian and Grace, but most media outlets were criticizing Ian's behavior. However, she knows that in society, people pretended not to know much due to Ian's influential position. But that was until she, who's the victim, stayed silent. If he thought she would be a fool who would stay silent even after being attacked, he's so wrong. She realizes in this situation, she should have exposed the truth sooner. Just then, they heard a commotion in the bakery shop. Salonia wonders who the person entering the shop is. Lady Abel questions why he is here. Salonia asked if Abel knew the identity of that person, to which Abel revealed that he's the night beast. Salonia couldn't help but find his face somehow familiar. In this world of romance novels, main characters have distinctive appearances, and protagonists usually have outstanding looks. But seeing someone for the first time with such sculpted beauty, moreover being called the Night Beast, there's no way an ordinary extra would have that nickname. However, she realizes that it's a fitting nickname for his appearance, though. The guy took something from the chef, and Salonia couldn't help but find him really suspicious. Meanwhile, Ella was lost in her own wild imagination about the man. Salonia then questions Abel if that man is doing something dangerous to the shop owner, to which Abel revealed that he's just taking food. Salonia asked for more clarification, and Abel clarifies, stating that he's distributing what he received here to hungry people. The other lady is really surprised since she thought he was a rowdy person. Salonia thinks about how maybe because he's famous for being virtuous. However, she wonders why she keeps getting this uneasy feeling. She had a strange feeling that she shouldn't let that person go like this. Salonia suddenly notices a scar on the man's chest and is shocked as that scar doesn't seem to be an ordinary wound. In this world, without a demon king, it should be a peaceful and safe place, and there shouldn't be anything that causes such wounds. She wonders who that man really is. Later, in the carriage, Ella mentions she hadn't seen the wound on the night beast before. She talks about rumors surrounding him, stories of him purging dangerous beasts and criminals. She questions if that could be the reason for the wound. Salonia thinks it didn't seem like a wound caused by a mere monster and wonders if there's more to it. Ella then asks Salonia about her day and if meeting nice people lifted her spirits. Salonia agrees, saying the outing was refreshing and the doubtful young ladies became friendly quickly. She even promised to invite them as guests to the next tea time. Ella expresses her desire to decorate the garden for the ladies' visit, but Salonia assures her it's already well-maintained. Salonia reflects on how, after transmigrating, she was always with the Savior, so her circle of friends was narrow. Only after distancing herself from them did she see the real world around her. Ella then asks Salonia about the Demon King's appearance, mentioning rumors she heard since only the Savior had seen him. She speculates that as the leader of the demons, he must look like one too. Salonia describes the Demon King as having black scales covering his entire body, a gigantic physique surpassing three meters, and chilling red eyes. 
She recalls it as horrifying. Ella mentions overhearing someone at the dessert shop saying the Demon King is extraordinarily beautiful, who can enchant anyone with just a glance. Salonia wonders if she'd let them continue to misunderstand, knowing she's the only one who has seen his real form. Just then, the carriage suddenly halted in its place, and Salonia questioned the coachman, Cohen, about what happened. He apologized, explaining that he was trying to cross the forest when some creatures gathered around them. Salonia realized that hungry demons might have followed them upon sensing signs of life. She asked Cohen if he was all right and if they could push through, but he replied that the horses seemed scared and wouldn't move an inch. Salonia thought staying there might get even more dangerous. She could handle a few demons if she had a sword, but there were too many. Cohen apologized again and suggested blocking off a few monsters in the front while the two of them drove the carriage out. Bro, mad respect for this dude. He's definitely scared, but still ready to sacrifice himself to save ladies. Dude is better than those fucking retards. Salonia refused to leave Cohen behind. She asked if he could rush if she chased away the ones blocking their path. Cohen said it was possible if they could do that. Salonia began to move outside and informed Cohen that she would create a temporary opening with her healing light, and once the path was clear, they would make their escape. She couldn't afford to let Ella and Cohen get hurt, so she needed to find a way no matter what. Ella pleaded with Salonia not to go outside, but Salonia assured her that everything would be fine and advised her to stay inside the carriage at all costs. Once outside, Salonia saw the monster and thought that she could create a brief opening with her healing light. If she signaled at the perfect time, they could make their escape. Salonia created a ball of healing light and directed it towards the monster, quickly telling Cohen to move the carriage. Unexpectedly, the demon still attacked Salonia for some reason. She wondered if her healing light magic was too weak as it unraveled much faster than she thought. Suddenly, a demon attacked Salonia from behind, caughting her off guard. Just then, someone used dark magic and killed the demon, ultimately saving Salonia from imminent death. She fell down and wondered what was happening as she was unable to move her body at all. She questioned if that spell was dark magic or if someone came to rescue them. Just then, someone approached Salonia, and as she looked at the person, she realized it was none other than the Night Beast. She wondered how he ended up here. Salonia suddenly noticed the face of the Nightly Beast and remembered why she felt a strange sense of deja vu from the moment she saw him at the cafe. But she didn't notice it because she couldn't see it up close at that time. She questioned how this man was here, as he was supposed to be dead. The guy questioned Salonia if she knew who he was. Before losing consciousness, Salonia thought about how she could forget the man she killed with her own hands, the so-called Demon King of the Underworld. Okay. That was hell unexpected. So, the Blondie is not the supposed Demon King after all. Now it made me wonder who is she in reality. Anyway, the scene shifts to a few months ago, right after the subjugation of the Demon King. Rayev expresses his relief that they finally brought peace to the world after defeating the Demon King. Ian tells him that everyone worked hard during this time. He further states that he sent a report to the palace about defeating the Demon King, and now they're on their way back. Rayev then expresses his gratitude to Salonia, as her healing magic made him feel lighter, so he'll take a look around before going back, just in case there are any remaining monsters. Salonia tells him to be careful on his way back. Salonia then sighs in exhaustion, as the final battle was really intense. And because of that, she used up all her remaining strength. She doesn't even have the strength to stand anymore, and she wonders if she can hold on until they get back. Salonia suddenly realizes that her dagger is missing. She wonders where her dagger went and if she left it in the castle. Later, inside the castle, Salonia realizes that she needs to find it quickly and get out. It's so dark in here. She thinks about how she could just leave it behind, but because it's a precious memento from the Demon King's subjugation, she couldn't just leave it. As she gets close to the dead body of the Demon King, Salonia wonders if he's really dead. She suddenly notices her dagger, and as she leans to grab it, she feels something behind her. She wonders what that was, as she definitely felt a presence. Salonia suddenly notices the body of a man. She wonders who that man is, as that's where the Demon King was defeated. She then realizes that this might be the true form of the Demon King. 
Suddenly, the man opens his eyes, and Salonia is shocked upon seeing this. She wonders if he's still alive. However, by looking at his lifeless eyes, she realizes that he might be trying to resurrect himself with that appearance again. She thinks about how she can't let the Demon King revive, so she takes her dagger and stabbed him to death. In the present, Salonia wakes up in her room, wondering if that was a dream. Just then, Ella arrives and questions Salonia if she's feeling all right. She states that it's fortunate that she woke up so soon. Salonia questions Ella about what had happened. However, Ella advises her to be careful as it hasn't been long since she was treated. Salonia interjects, questioning her about what exactly happened and what time it is now. Ella reveals that it's been about two hours since they escaped from the forest. Upon hearing this, Salonia realizes that everything that happened in the forest wasn't just a dream. She wonders about the Demon King. Ella then tells Salonia that she'll help her up and asks if she isn't going to greet their savior. Salonia seems puzzled by this, and Ella explains that she's talking about the one who saved their lives. Salonia silently watches Ella for a while, thinking about how there's no way. She then quickly runs away from her room and reaches another room. As she opens the door, she is greeted by her father, who is happy to see her awake. The Duke tells Salonia that she came at a good time and advises her to greet the person who saved her. As she looks at the corner, she literally finds the Demon King there, sitting like a gentleman. She wonders why the Demon King is in her house. The guy then tells Salonia that it's nice to see her again. Salonia thinks about the unforgettable crimson eyes, even in her dream, and the sharp sensation as the dagger pierced through his flesh. In that moment, she thought the nightmare-like ordeal had ended forever for her. However, she soon realizes that's not the case. The Duke also leaves Salonia alone with the Demon King as he's busy. He advises her to treat their guest well as he saved her life. Salonia wonders how her father could leave her like that. The Demon King then questions Salonia if she knows him, to which Salonia tells him that there's no way, since she's seeing him for the first time today. She then expresses her gratitude to him for saving her life. She tells him that she'll take care of him as much as she wants, but asks him to leave now. The Demon King then mentions how she said that he was supposed to be dead earlier, and Salonia realizes that he remembered everything. Still, she finds one more thing strange. Why is he talking to her as if he's seeing her for the first time? She wonders if he didn't remember who she is somehow. The scene shifted to a location surrounded by water, where a cloaked man approached a glowing altar. Another man asked how it went. The first man bowed and revealed he had acquired two more items and put down the item he was carrying with him. The other man thought it wasn't enough and insisted they needed to work faster. Because at this rate, it'll take ages to complete their task. He instructed the first man to speed things up, to which he agreed. Meanwhile, Salonia wondered if he genuinely didn't remember her, or if he was scheming something. She realized she needed to kick him out of the manor before he could regain his memory. Salonia told him he must have mistaken her for someone else. The Demon King asked if she planned to stay quiet until the end, then revealed he had lost his memory, didn't know anyone, and had nowhere to go. Salonia asked what that had to do with her, Ignoring her question, he said he had no choice but to stay there, shocking her. Salonia responded that while she appreciated him saving her, she never agreed to let him stay. She warned that if he didn't leave, she would call the guards. The Demon King stared at her for a moment, then stood up and began to move. Salonia wondered what's with this guy, I mean, Demon Lord. He then used his powers to create a tiny flame on his finger and asked if she knew how long it would take for the fire to spread throughout the entire manor. Shocked, Salonia asked what he was trying to do and warned him that she would call the guards immediately. He told her to go ahead if she wanted to witness what happens herself. Salonia flinched, realizing she needed to stay calm. She had gone through so much to get rid of the demon lord, but she knew it was impossible to defeat him alone. If she provoked him the wrong way and he recalled what happened, she could find herself in grave danger. Besides, she couldn't possibly reveal that he was the demon lord who threatened world peace and that she was the one who stabbed him. She guessed the reason he was acting this way was because he thought she was the only one who remembered anything about him. She then said she really didn't know him and no matter how hard he tried, she couldn't give him the answer he expected. The demon king confidently asserted that he had plenty of time to prove it 
adding that her father had already given him permission to stay as long as he wanted. Upon hearing this, Salonia sighed, wondering what the hell her father was thinking. The Demon King continued, saying he couldn't refuse such an honest request. Salonia whispered that they wouldn't mind, though. The Demon King noted that it seemed she didn't want him there for some reason. He offered to leave right away if she told him everything she knew. However, Salonia insisted she knew nothing. Undeterred, the Demon King told her to let him know if she changed her mind, as he wasn't in any hurry. Salonia wondered why the Demon King was acting so childishly. She believed he wouldn't try anything right now, and if she succeeds to persuade him, she might be able to send him away without any problems. Just then, the Demon King interrupted her thoughts and asked if there were going to be any snacks, remarking that at this rate, he'd be eating them for dinner. Hearing his words, Salonia contemplated her chances again, questioning if she would really be able to overcome this. The next day, Ella inquired if Salonia had a nice chat with Mr. Beastly. She continued, saying that Salonia had no idea how amazing he was when he saved her. Salonia stayed quiet, thinking about how the previous night, after her conversation with the Demon Lord, Ella had told her everything that had happened in the woods. Just like in his first attack, he took down the remaining monsters in the blink of an eye and then escorted them safely back to the manor. Ella further explained that Mr. Beastly had sent all the monsters flying with a single motion. Silonia thought to herself that he had also sent her flying through the air when she was fighting him as a hero. Silonia then asked if there were only good rumors about him. Ella revealed that she had asked many people, but everyone only had good things to say about him. She also mentioned that some people in the slums even worshipped him. Silonia thought it was all just nonsense. That man was the demon lord, who made the whole world tremble in horror. He could never be a hero. However, Salonia was confused about one thing. When the demon lord resurrected, a rift appeared in the woods, and monsters poured out of it, causing great harm. When the demon lord was defeated, the rift disappeared, allowing them to be certain that everything was over. Since a new rift hadn't appeared, she wondered if they could really still refer to that man as the demon lord. The following day, Salonia meets with her father, who asks if she had a nice chat with their guest. Salonia seems hesitant for some reason and mentions that she heard he allowed that man to stay in the manor. The duke replies affirmatively. The duke mentions that the man saved his daughter, so he must repay his kindness. Moreover, he's also referred to as the hero of the slums, and it's hard to come across such a respectable young person these days. The duke continues saying that having an esteemed man like him staying in their mansion is a truly invaluable opportunity. Silonia replies that he's right, but asks if it wouldn't be enough to express their gratitude with money. The Duke responds that they will definitely pay him, but since he doesn't have anywhere to stay at the moment, he thought it would be good if he stayed at their manor for the time being. However, Silonia argues that they don't know where he's from and that he might be dangerous. Upon hearing this, the Duke coldly stares at her and tells that she must never forget her duty as a noble. If she has plenty, it's important to know how to share. Now that's some fatherly teaching. Silonia thinks to herself that she expected this from her father, but she can't help but feel frustrated. Noblesse oblige is the belief that nobles should act generously towards as many people as possible, and it's a belief Duke Galloway Bassine has held on to his entire life. Silonia thinks she cannot give up here, she needs to stop the demon lord, even if it means revealing the truth. Silonia then tries to tell the duke about the man's true identity, but for some reason, she can't. She suddenly finds herself unable to speak when trying to tell him about the demon lord. The duke inquires if something is wrong. Silonia then tries to write it down on paper, but her hands begin to tremble when she is about to disclose his identity. She wonders what's happening to her, and realizes she can't write or speak the words demon lord for some reason. The duke tells Salonia that it's enough for today. Whatever the case, the man saved her life, and all eyes are on him right now. He continues that if they simply handed him some money and kicked him out, it would create a bad image for their family name. Salonia realizes that she can't persuade her father and has no choice but to keep an eye on the demon lord while she looks for another solution. Salonia then assures the Duke that she will make sure the man finds his stay here comfortable, and the Duke praises her for her thoughtfulness. He then pats her and reveals that he was startled when he heard she fell unconscious again. He asks her to always make sure her body is not harmed in any way, 
as she is all he has. Hmm. I don't know why I'm feeling like this, but that stare, that fucking stare, is giving me fake bastard vibes. On the other hand, we see the demon lord panting heavily, his mind wandering back to Salonia. He believes that her expression definitely indicated that she knew him. He wonders what sort of relationship they had for her to say something like that. But he realizes that it doesn't matter as long as he regains his memory. All he knows now is that Salonia is the only person who remembers him, and he definitely won't miss this opportunity. If she plans to hide the truth until the end, he'll just make her talk himself. The next day, at the Cherville Manor, Ian was furious at the newspaper publishers for questioning if his relationship with Grace was an act of romance or adultery. He then instructed his butler to compile a list of all the newspapers, finding it extremely ridiculous for them to question his qualifications over such a small issue. After all, he was one of the saviors who took down the demon lord. He couldn't believe that people had turned their backs on him so easily when not long ago they used to worship him. Just then, the butler arrived and asked Ian what he should do about the letter from the Besson family. Ian told him to bring it to him. Ian always considered Salonia to be an innocent and loving woman, but her behavior outside the Roblanc that day made him realize she had been deceiving him all this time. He chuckled, noting that people viewed her as some sort of tragic heroine, and these articles would never have been published if they knew her true self. As the butler handed Ian the letter, he thought it was probably a request for compensation in return for the broken engagement. Salonia must want something big, considering she even made him write a pledge. However, as Ian began to read the letter, he was completely shocked by its content. He then instructed his butler to send a letter to House Bassine immediately, stating that he would be visiting today. Meanwhile, Salonia sat quietly in her garden, unsure how to begin her letter to Rayev. She didn't know when the Demon King would regain his memories, which was why she decided to warn the heroes, hoping that at least one of them would trust her. However, there was one problem. She was still unable to write the words Demon King and wondered if she was somehow cursed. She had no idea what was going on with her, but before she could contemplate further, Ella arrived and informed her that Jillian had arrived. After some time, Salonia met with Jillian in her study. Without wasting any time, she told him that the reason she had summoned him was that she wanted him to gather information regarding the Beast of Night and to keep an eye on Grace Benet. And do not misunderstand this, our main character is no longer curious about her relationship with those asswipes. She just wanted to find out if Grace had any connection with the Demon Lord, as it was suspicious that she and the Demon Lord had shown up around the same time. Jillian obliged. Suddenly, they heard a commotion outside, and Salonia recognized the man's voice as Ian's. Jillian stood up and asked if Duke Cherville still bothered her, preparing to deal with him on her behalf. However, Salonia told him not to and requested that he leave, to which he agreed. Just then, Ian burst into the room, shouting her name. Salonia told him to at least behave like a decent human being and have a seat first, as she planned to hold him responsible for his rudeness. Undeterred, Ian demanded an explanation. Salonia cut him off, insisting he mind his manners while speaking to her and questioned what happened to the dignity a duke should display. She mentioned that she had a visitor and asked if the servant hadn't told him to wait. She further mocked him, asking if this was the best display of elegance he could muster. Ian frowned, questioning if this was how House Bassine intended to treat the Cherville family from now on. Salonia countered by asking why he was dragging their families into a personal matter and if he couldn't do anything without relying on his surname. Ian, taken aback, believed she was acting out because he chose another woman over her. Salonia chuckled, asking if he was out of his mind. When Ian inquired why she was going this far, she told him to get to the point and asked if he had come personally because of the compensation issue. Ian confirmed, stating that what she asked for was out of the question and suggesting she consider something else. Salonia reminded him that he was speaking with the heir of House Bassine, and nothing else mattered to her except what she wrote in the letter. Ian asked why she needed it, but Salonia said it was none of his business. She emphasized that the only thing of value to her in House Cherville was the sword. The sword she requested as compensation was the one Ian used to kill the Demon Lord. It held great symbolism, but was also destined to become a holy sword in the future. 
Salonia suspected that Ian must have realized the sword's potential, which explained his reluctance. Ian then asked if there was something she knew about that sword, he didn't. Salonia feigned ignorance, smirking and asking if the sword held some special powers, noting his reluctance to part with it. Ian flinched and yelled that there was nothing special about the sword. Salonia grinned, telling him that if the sword was truly nothing exceptional, he should send it to her and warned him not to deceive her, as she would have the imperial court notarize the exchange. Ian realized he had made a mistake, while Salonia felt satisfied having put him in his place. Salonia then mentioned an upcoming congratulatory banquet at the palace for her, explaining that she couldn't attend the victory ceremony due to her health. Mistaking this as an invitation, Ian said he had no intention of attending such a banquet. Salonia clarified that she was actually worried he might shamelessly show up despite his act of adultery and assured him he wasn't invited. She then told him to leave, saying it was unbearable to be in the same room as him. Before leaving, Ian acts cocky, telling her not to show her face again, though in reality, Salonia's attitude had shaken him to the core. He couldn't fathom that she had seemingly forgotten about him so soon. Just then, the demon lord entered the room, blocking Ian's path. Ian instructed him to step aside, but the demon lord grinned, commenting that Ian was so small he hadn't even noticed him. Ian was shocked upon hearing this, as until now, no one has ever exceeded him. The demon lord then called Salonia by name, irritating Ian with his familiar tone. Before things could escalate, Salonia stopped Ian, advising him not to be rude to her guest. The demon lord smiled mockingly at Ian. Once outside the room, Ian questioned if Salonia really had someone else other than him. Feeling nauseous, he wondered why he felt this way. The following day, Grace visited Rayef and informed him that she had been looking all over for him. Rayef responded that she should have just called and he would have come right away like a pup. Grace then inquired if he was also going to participate in the holy ritual, to which Rayef replied affirmatively, the holy ritual is a 15-day ceremony where all the holy knights partake to erase fatigue and regain purity and virtue. Rayev expressed sadness, knowing he wouldn't be able to see her for some time, and was glad to meet her before he left. Grace handed him a cake she had baked herself, knowing the ritual would be tiring and hoping it would serve as a snack afterwards. Rayev, with a sorrowful expression, mentioned he was very pleased she remembered the ritual from his brief mention at the victory ceremony. Grace smiled and told him to make sure he eats it afterwards, cautioning that he might feel dizzy if he moves too much after fasting. Rayev happily obliged. She reminded him again to at least eat one slice. Oh, how thoughtful! Grace is giving him a cake with extra brainwashing potion. I hope some cockroaches eat it and start chasing her. Just then, a priest arrived and informed Rayev it was time to leave. As Rayev began to depart, Grace suddenly held him and asked him to promise he would return to her in good health. Blushing, Rayev gave his word and took his leave. Meanwhile, Salonia inquired about the demon lord's presence, to which he replied that she made it sound like he was harassing her. The demon lord then asked about the identity of the man from earlier, clarifying by asking if she disliked him or if he was bothering her. He then suggested, quite seriously, that he could kill the man for her. Shocked, Salonia realized that while the demon lord might have lost his memory, his temperament remained unchanged. He reiterated that if she wanted, he would bring the man's head to her. Salonia firmly replied that no matter how much she hated someone, she would never do such a thing. The demon lord, surprised, remarked that based on her earlier expression, he thought she wanted to kill the man, but guessed he was wrong. Later that night, Salonia silently walked through the corridor, unable to sleep due to the recent stressful events. She initially thought the demon lord would cause problems and act violently. But other than occasionally encountering him in the hallway, he rarely left his room. She heard he wasn't even eating and wondered if it was all right to leave him like this. Suddenly, she heard strange sounds coming from the nearby room where the demon lord was staying, causing her to flinch. Approaching the door, she wondered what in the world he was doing. No, 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 no. Girl, you can't just go peeking in people's rooms without knocking, especially when you heard strange grunts. A month ago, the demon lord woke up in an abandoned house deep in the woods, having lost all memories. In order to find out who he was, he wandered from town to town, 
but he couldn't find any clues or people who knew him. During his wanderings, he discovered that he could wield a strange power. Additionally, he realized that every time the clock struck midnight, he felt an unbearable pain on his scar, a dreadful pain that defied description. He wondered if this suffering would only cease once he retrieved his memory. In the present, Salonia entered the room and asked what he was doing, but she found no one there. Suddenly, she heard the same sound coming from the bathroom. Opening the door, she found the demon lord on the ground, panting heavily. She quickly rushed to him and asked if he was all right. The demon lord told her to get out, insisting he could take care of it himself. Silonia retorted that it wasn't the time to let his pride get in the way, but he responded that it was none of her business. Suddenly, he felt a sharp pang in his chest. Silonia realized that she didn't have time to call a physician and would have to use her healing power. She hesitated, realizing that she was about to heal not just any person, but the demon lord she had previously slain. She was also concerned that if he saw her healing magic, he might regain his memory. Thankfully, the servants arrived, and she immediately instructed them to contact the physician. While waiting, Silonia decided to perform some first aid. Just as she was about to apply some medicine on his scar, the demon lord grabbed her hand and stopped her. Miraculously, the pain that felt like his body was being ripped apart suddenly disappeared when he held Salonia. He then suddenly pulled her close and asked how she did it. Salonia, confused, asked for clarification. The demon lord realized that when he touched Salonia, the pain completely vanished, and if he let go of her hand, the pain would return. He then tells her that he'll let her treat him if she holds his hand. Puzzled, Silonia wonders what he's trying to do, but she gives in because he looks rather desperate, unlike his usual image. As Silonia looks for the medicine, the demon lord holds her other hand, forcing them closer. Silonia blushes, wondering if they're not a little too close. Just then, the servant arrives with the physician and finds both Silonia and the demon lord in a rather awkward position. The servant hesitantly asks if they should just leave them alone. Embarrassed, Salonia quickly clarifies that it's just a misunderstanding. The next day, Salonia received the Holy Sword with the Imperial Court's verification of its authenticity, and she's relieved that Ian hadn't tampered with it. As she cleaned the sword, she thought it was a wise decision to ask for it as alimony. Suddenly, the Demon Lord entered her room and asked if she was done with her work. She inquired if he was feeling better the last night, as the physician sees his condition, she assesses that his wounds weren't fatal. They had gone through cycles of healing and infection due to a lack of proper treatment, making the pain severe. The physician had also asked about the origin of his scar, to which the demon lord had replied he didn't know, revealing that it was there when he woke up three months ago. This made Salonia flinch, as it aligned with the time the heroes defeated him and she had stabbed him. In the present, the demon lord thanked a certain someone for making the pain bearable. He then asked about the sword, and Salonia decided to test if it triggered any memories by revealing it was the holy sword that had slain the demon king. He responded nonchalantly, okay, and Salonia sighed in relief, confirming he didn't know anything. He then inquired if the sword belonged to her, to which she explained it used to belong to the blonde man he had bumped into last time. The demon lord further asked if that man was still coming and going, implying he felt he had let him off the hook too easily. Salonia clarified that he had just sent her this sword. She then grinned, imagining Ian going crazy and causing a scene. And she isn't wrong, because Ian was throwing everything in his room in a fit of rage, furious that someone like Salonia, who didn't appreciate the value of the holy sword, had gotten hold of it. After defeating the demon king, he felt something from that sword and planned to examine it to see if it had absorbed the Demon King's power. His thoughts then drifted to the Demon King and he wondered about his true identity. He was infuriated that the man hadn't bowed to him, a duke. Ian thought that Salonia might be using that man to make him jealous, but he couldn't believe she would go to such lengths. Determined to teach that guy a lesson, he became even more agitated. Just then, the door opened and Grace entered the room Ian coldly told her to leave as he was busy, which shocked her. Realizing his mistake, he tried to explain, but Grace left without a word. Alone, Ian wondered what was wrong with him, since he was never this easily bothered before. 
Later that night, at the Bessine Manor, the Duke welcomed everyone to dinner. A man seated with them greeted Salonia and asked how she had been. He was Rubawa Sid, captain of House Bessine's Order of Knights, and the second son of Count Sid. Despite numerous job offers due to his exceptional talent, he chose to stay with House Bessine out of loyalty to Salonia's father. Huh, somehow I'm not convinced. The Duke apologized to the Demon King for not inviting him to dinner, explaining that he had been very busy. The Demon King replied that it didn't matter, causing Salonia to break out in a cold sweat, thinking this was why she didn't want him to interact with humans. Rubivius, noting his tone, questions how he dared to show such disrespect to the Duke. However, the Duke assured Rubevus that it was fine. Rubevus then asked Salonia if she was feeling better, and she confirmed she was. He mentioned that he was relieved, since he hadn't been able to sleep out of worry for her. See, I told you, the boy has his own motivation. The Demon King then remarked that Rubevus looked quite rested for someone who hadn't been sleeping. Startled, Rubevus asked what he meant by that. Salonia, stressed, stared at the Demon King, silently pleading for him to stop this madness. The Duke then mentioned that he heard the guy had some serious wounds and asked if he was feeling all right. Salonia nudged the Demon King, hoping for a better answer. The Demon King replied that he would be fine, and the Duke encouraged him to eat. However, the Demon King asked if it was really necessary to eat. He stared at the dishes, wondering what it meant to be hungry, which surprised both Rubawus and the Duke. Rubawus then mocked him, claiming he understood why the Demon King was weird, suggesting he must have hurt his head too. Salonia grabbed the Demon King's shirt, trying to stop him, and confirmed that he did have a head injury that made it difficult for him to feel sensations. Just then, a servant informed the Duke that it was time for him to leave. As the Duke began to depart, Rubewus followed him. In a subsequent scene, the Demon King was wandering around. He had once helped a cafe owner fend off some thugs, and in return, the owner gave him some bread. While he was there, he met two children who asked if he was going to eat all the bread by himself. Since he couldn't feel hunger, he gave the bread to the children. He saw the happiness on their faces as they ate, and this was when he learned about the word hunger and wondered why he didn't experience such sensations. Once alone, Silonia mentioned that she could now eat properly since there were fewer people. She suddenly noticed the demon king staring at her and encouraged him to eat. As he looked at the dish, he wondered about the unfamiliar feeling he was having. Observing how Salonia was eating with a fork, he tried to mimic her. While she silently watched him, she thought he looked quite natural while eating and seemed to have gotten used to table manners. She then asked if he hadn't eaten anything since he lost his memory. He confirmed, saying he hadn't felt the need to. Salonia realized that not feeling basic human needs like hunger or the need to sleep meant he was far from human in nature even though he looked like an ordinary person. She told him that if he ever wanted something to eat, he could just ask anyone around him. The Demon King asked if she would join him as well. When she replied negatively, he said that there was no reason to eat then. Silonia then asked why he gave food to those people. He replied that they were in need. When she questioned if he meant the need for food, the Demon King clarified that they needed him, the one giving out the food. Later that night, Silonia sat quietly on her bed, contemplating what the Demon King had said about people needing him. She wondered if he was trying to recover his memory by helping others, or if he couldn't tolerate seeing people in pain. However, she chose not to delve into it further, thinking it didn't concern her. She also wondered when he would come. After the meal, the Demon King made a surprising proposal. He would leave her house within a month if she cooperated with him. Salonia asked what he wanted her to do. The Demon King grinned and asked for her hand. When he held it, he explained that her touch alleviated all his pain, which shocked Salonia. She asked if he was referring to the chest pain he suffered from every night, and the Demon King confirmed it. He said that she must know the reason behind his suffering, since she knew who he was. Shocked, Salonia withdrew her hand, but accepted his proposal with his promise to leave in a month. However, she realized that she would need to stay with him every night for over a month, fearing he might regain his memory in the meantime. The Demon King got close to her and asked if she wanted him out of her house, explaining that if she didn't help him, he planned to stay there for good, as her father seemed approving of that. 
Silonia pushed him away and agreed to his proposal, but added her condition. He must visit her room without anyone knowing. In the present, Silonia was taken aback to see that he had come to her room using teleportation, although the demon king seemed unaware of what teleportation was. Just then, he began to feel pain and fell on Silonia's shoulder. She quickly held his hand and gave him a chair to sit in. Seeing his painful expression, she couldn't believe how they ended up in this situation. Still, she was glad because the deal was beneficial for her too, as he promised not to harm her or those around her. After some time, the demon king returned to his normal self, and Salonia felt uneasy. When she saw him in pain, she couldn't determine if he was a normal human being or the evil demon lord deserving of death. The demon king suddenly leaned in close to say goodbye, and Salonia realized he was in a good mood today. Later, as he strolled through a corridor, the thought of a perfectly cooked meal filled his mind, accompanied by a feeling he had never experienced before. Hunger. Up until now, he had been nameless and denied by the world, living without knowing who he was. Silonia was the first person to acknowledge his existence. He was certain that staying by her side would break the shackles of his cursed life. He wondered if Silonia really thought he would let her go after this night. Not a chance! He grinned and resolved that even if he didn't regain his memory, and even if she never told him anything, he would keep Silonia by his side forever. After a few days, the demon king knocked on Salonia's door, forcing her to wake up. Annoyed, Salonia told him it was about time he learned to eat by himself. Undeterred, the demon king warned that if she didn't come out, he would break down the door. With no choice, Salonia complied. It had been a week since their agreement, and every night at midnight, he teleported to her room so she could hold his hand to alleviate his pain. In the present, Salonia inquired if she had to eat breakfast with him as well. The demon king replied that she just needed to wake up a bit earlier and asked if it was that hard for her. Annoyed, Salonia thought she was lacking sleep because of him. She didn't want to wake up early, but eating every meal together was part of their deal. She wondered why he was being so childish, since he could survive without eating. On the other hand, she was glad he upheld his part of the deal and never teleported into her room unless it was midnight. Nor did he interfere with her people. While thinking about all this, Silonia suddenly fell asleep while eating. The demon king stared at her face, thinking she was certainly a sight to see. After some time, they went outside, and the demon king, knowing nothing, continuously pointed at random things and asked Silonia what they were. At one point, he even pointed at an ant and asked what it was, making Silonia wonder if he was messing with her. He then pointed at a knight and maid and asked what they were doing. As Salonia glanced at them, she was horrified to see that they were kissing in public. She quickly instructed them to get a room, and they agreed. The demon king further inquired what they were doing. Salonia shyly replied that they were doing something people do when they like each other. Hmm, I'll remember that. After some time, Jillian arrived at the Besson Manor and informed Salonia about the night beast. But like Grace, he was unable to acquire any worthwhile information. He also told her that he had been keeping an eye on Grace, but had found nothing intriguing. However, Salonia was convinced that what was happening with Grace and the Demon Lord could not be a mere coincidence. She wondered what she was missing. Salonia then dismissed Jillian, thinking that she should try to obtain information from another guild. Before leaving, Jillian apologized to Salonia for not living up to her expectations. Just then, Silonia noticed a piece of paper on the couch where Jillian had been sitting. She grabbed it and asked if it was his, causing Jillian to flinch and swiftly snatch the paper away from her. Surprised by how Jillian acted over a piece of paper, Silonia asked if it was a love letter. Jillian replied with a serious tone that it was something like that and quickly took his leave. Once alone, Silonia questioned herself if this wasn't a dream. She distinctly remembered seeing a strange magic circle and the most disturbing part was the sight of Grace's name inscribed upon it. The Gillian is not so cute anymore, and even the guild has been compromised. Salonia thought it was possible that Gillian was hiding things from her and decided to inquire elsewhere. Suddenly, Ella arrived and informed Salonia that a fight had broken out between Sid and Mr. Beastly. Meanwhile, the servants wondered if they should intervene. Just then, Salonia arrived and saw Sid kneeling with a sword in the Demon King's hand. 
She stopped both of them and inquired what he was trying to do. Sid spoke up, saying it was all right and that he could handle it. Salonia quickly instructed the servants to take him to the physician immediately. Once alone, Salonia asked the demon king if it was so difficult to keep his word. The demon king replied that he just did what Sid wanted him to do. Hearing this, Salonia realized he wasn't sorry at all. She believed it was all her fault for trusting that a demon lord would keep his promise. No matter how normal he looked, at the end of the day, he was nothing but a demon. Salonia finds it hard to trust him anymore and told him she would continue with their deal and fulfill her promise. She coldly stated that she hoped he wouldn't forget his promise to leave the manor in a month. As Salonia began to leave, the demon king stayed silent, and the grip on the sword he was holding loosened, causing it to fall. Ella, watching from a distance, witnessed the entire scene. Later that night, long past dinner time, Salonia decided not to go down to the dining room. She wondered if the demon king would shamelessly show up again, because after witnessing his behavior, it didn't seem unrealistic to her. Just then, Ella entered the room with the hot tea Salonia had requested. Ella informed her that Sir Sid would recover quickly if he massaged his shoulder with a hot towel. Salonia replied that it was good to hear. Salonia then instructed Ella to leave her alone for a while. However, Ella inquired if Salonia didn't want to hear the other side of the story. Salonia denies it, saying she was a bit tired. Undeterred, Ella insisted that she knew it wasn't her place to interfere, but what she wanted to tell her was very important. She revealed that Sir Sid wasn't the only one who got injured earlier. Mr. Beasley was also cut, and she had clearly seen blood dripping from his arm. She continued, explaining that the duel wasn't because of an argument, but because Sid had instigated Mr. Beasley by calling him a beggar, who had caught her ladyship's attention only because he was lucky. Salonia was shocked upon hearing that Sid was actually the one to cross the line. She instructed Ella to gather all the knights and servants who were at the training ground at that time, as she had something she would like to ask them. While Salonia was meeting with the not-so-cute-anymore Jillian, Sid approached the Demon King and mentioned that he had no idea he was still in the manor. Sid continued, saying he didn't expect him to be so shameless as to stay this long. The Demon King wondered what shameless meant, prompting Ella to explain that it refers to someone who has no shame. Sid then asked if the Demon King thought he was important, just because the Duke treated him with respect. He told him he was nothing more than a good-for-nothing from the slums, a parasite lucky enough to stay here, and advised him to leave as quickly as possible and stop bothering Salonia. Oh, how immature. Oh. The Demon King nonchalantly replied with a big no. This irritated Sid who mentioned hearing that the night beast could wield a good sword and officially challenged him to a duel with the condition that if he won, the demon king would have to leave the manor immediately. The demon king confidently accepted the proposal. In the present, Salonia worriedly roamed her room, as a lot of time had passed already. She wondered if he was just being late or if he was not coming at all. She spoke with all the servants and knights, and they all said the same thing. It was just a standard duel, and Mr. Beasley never used his sword, even though he held it in his hand. It was actually Sid who threw sand at him, which was when Mr. Beasley got cut. Salonia felt bad for not believing him, despite knowing him better than anyone else. Just then, the Demon King himself arrived, looking in very bad shape. Salonia quickly rushed toward him and asked if he was in pain, but he didn't say anything. As Salonia looked at his face, she realized his condition was especially bad today and she noticed blood dripping from his biceps. She then mentioned hearing that he never attacked once, but the Demon King told her it didn't matter. Salonia realized he was upset and knew it was all her fault for jumping to conclusions without hearing his side of the story. She suddenly apologized to him, causing him to flinch. He asked what she just said, and she repeated that she was sorry for her mistake. He asked her to say it again, and she apologized once more. He remarked that the feeling wasn't too bad, which made Salonia smile. Later, as he sat beside her, he told her to call him by his name. Salonia inquired what his name was, but the Demon King replied that he didn't know and told her to make one for him. Shocked, she asked if he really meant it, and he agreed. Salonia remembered that he was only referred to as the Demon Lord, even in the original novel. She wondered what else she could call him other than that. Suddenly, a thought came to her mind. 
and she suggested the name Tan. She explained that it was easy to say and suited him well. The Demon King agreed, mentioning that from this moment onwards, his name would be Tan. Silonia was glad that he liked the name, but in reality, she had gotten the name from the word Satan. This girl has zero creative instinct. How will the poor guy introduce himself if he ever decides to? Hmm. Hello, I am Tan, short for Satan. <laughs> Meanwhile, we see Sid angrily throwing things in his room. After his defeat, he was summoned by the Duke himself. As the captain of House Basin's Order of Knights, losing to a wandering knight, especially with so many witnesses, was a disgrace. When he tried to explain, the Duke simply told him to get lost and put him on probation. Sid thought about how hard he had worked to become the captain, and now everything had almost come tumbling down. However, he knew that if the Duke had taken matters into his own hands, there wouldn't be any rumors, and he would still be able to keep his position. However, the most unsettling and disturbing part for him was that Salonia herself confronted him about his actions and warned him to make sure something like this never happened again. In the present, he slammed the desk, unable to believe that Salonia was taking that man's side. He thought about the wedding talks with Duke Cherville and how he was willing to step aside. However, now he couldn't stand the idea of handing her over to some beggar from the slums. Unless it was someone better than him, he decided to make sure no one else would get her. Hand her over. You make it sound like you're her father. She's not an object, nor is she yours to keep or give away in the first place. The next day, Salonia went out with Ella to the magic district in the west and the shopping district in the south. Her goal was to find information about Jillian's strange note in the western district and to have a dress made for her congratulatory party in the southern district. Ella then inquired if she had sorted everything out with Mr. Beastly. Shocked, Silonia asked for more clarification. Ella explained that they had breakfast together, and in a pleasant atmosphere that too. Silonia blushed and mentioned that she guessed Ella could say they had sorted things out. Silonia then remembered Tan's angry glare when she told him that he had to eat lunch alone because she needed to go out. Meanwhile, in Montero Street's Western District, Silonia inquired with many people if they knew anything about a magic circle on sheepskin paper. To her dismay, the process was so outdated that no one sold sheepskin paper anymore. Silonia realized that she might not be able to find anything this way. But suddenly, a shopkeeper advised her to check out Weeklander's store, explaining that he was very knowledgeable about old magic. This made Silonia very happy, as not all hope was lost. After some time, they arrived at Weeklander's shop and entered. Ella suddenly noticed a jelly-like thing and asked if it was an artifact. Just then, a man revealed to her that it was a house decoration made by drying a goblin's tongue. That man was none other than Weeklander himself, the owner of the shop. Salonia then told him that she was looking for a sheepskin paper with a magic circle drawn on it. Weeklander inquired if she remembered what kind of magic circle it was, but Salonia replied that she didn't. Weeklander revealed that drawing a magic circle on sheepskin paper was a very old method, and if someone was really using it like she said, they might have wanted to hide something. These days, people draw magic circles on portable artifacts. Once they draw the circle, they can keep using it, but it does leave a trace, which means others can tell what kind of magic they were trying to use. Upon hearing this, Silonia contemplated what Jillian was trying to hide from her. Just then, Weeklander spoke up, saying that they didn't have what she was looking for, but he had a book that might have a clue. It's a book about magic circles. He won't find anything right away since he hasn't used it in a while, but if she gives him a few days, he can probably find what she's looking for. Silonia quickly agreed. As she began to leave, Weeklander called her from behind and asked if she often felt unwell. She replied in the negative, and he smiled upon hearing this, telling her to take care of her health. Once outside, Salonia pondered the meaning behind his question, wondering if he knew something. Meanwhile, in the slums area, Tan arrived with a packet full of bread and gave it to a girl, who thanked him in return. Just then, a guy named Maxwell called Tan from behind, and for some reason, Tan found Maxwell really annoying. As it turned out a few months ago, when Tan woke up in these slums having lost his memory, Maxwell approached him without hesitation and offered various forms of help. In the present, Maxwell began to follow him and asked all sorts of questions about the Duke's manner. 
Tan ignored him and advised him to just have some of the bread he brought. However, he suddenly halted when Maxwell asked if Lady Salonia was really as beautiful as the rumors said. He began to contemplate what Maxwell just said and came to realize that she did resemble some flower he saw on the street, a small, simple purple flower that could make anyone stop in their tracks and take a closer look at it. He then suddenly turned and asked Maxwell how he knew Salonia. Maxwell replied that everyone in the Empire knew who Lady Salonia was. She was one of the four saviors. Tan felt something upon hearing this, but then asked what a savior was. Shocked, Maxwell inquired how he could not know about such a famous story, the story of the four saviors that would become a legend one day. Meanwhile, at the Verandi boutique, the owner, Verandi, showed Salonia a dress design, mentioning that it would match her lovely lilac-colored hair perfectly. The Verandi boutique was a dress shop run by a designer every noble lady in the empire desired to work with. As the Empress's exclusive boutique, securing even a single appointment could be challenging. However, being the heir of the Besson household and the savior of the continent, it was no big deal for Salonia. Salonia thought the design felt rather over-extravagant. Verandi showed her many designs, hoping Salonia would like at least one of them. However, Salonia just stayed silent, taken aback by Verandi's over-enthusiasm. Just then, Verandi stood and told Salonia that she would bring her secret weapon now. Once alone, Salonia thought to herself that she should have chosen one of the dresses Verandi had shown her. Just then, she heard Ella's scream. She inquired what was the matter, and Ella just pointed at the door. As it turned out, it was Tan who had entered the store out of nowhere. Later, as they both sat together, she inquired how he knew she was there. Tan replied that she had told him that morning herself that she would come here. Silonia further inquired why he was there. Tan responded by questioning if he was not allowed there. Before Silonia could respond, Verandi arrived with her new designs. She suddenly noticed Tan and asked if he was with Silonia. As Verandi looked at him clearly, she thought that he exuded a very unique aura. He didn't look like a noble from the way he was dressed, but he seemed strangely elegant to her. She thought that if he changed his clothes and tied his hair, suddenly she realized that Salonia had been waiting for her and asked if she would like to try on the sample that hadn't been released, to which Salonia affirmed. Ella then advised Tan to wait for a moment, as ladies normally take a very long time to get changed. However, Tan told her to address him by his name, not Mr. Beastly, and she obliged. As Tan noticed Salonia in a beautiful dress, his mind wandered back to the question of whether Salonia was really pretty. He then stood and began to leave. Ella inquired where he was heading. Tan, in reply, questioned if Ella had known Salonia for a long time, to which Ella affirmed. He then asked if Salonia was beautiful. Ella replied enthusiastically, stating that her ladyship was the most beautiful woman in the world. He then inquired if everyone's heart tingled when they looked at her. Ella asked for more clarification, However, just then, Verandi arrived and asked if Tan could follow her for a moment, to which he agreed. And Ella noticed Tan blushing profusely and wondered if he... Well, that's one way to confess your feelings. And just like that, the Demon King's heart started tingling, just waiting for when he remembers she stabbed his heart. Later, as Salonia sat with Verandi, she asked why she was looking for the gentleman she had arrived with. Verandi explained that she had designed an outfit, but it ended up being too large, and Tan was the only one tall enough to wear it. Salonia thought to herself that if this outfit was originally intended for the crown prince, it must be one of the most extravagant garments in the empire. Sensing Salonia's hesitation, Verandi offered to let Tan try it on first if she preferred. Surprised, Salonia asked if that was really possible, and Verandi confirmed it was. In the present, Verandi assisted Tan in putting on the outfit, while Salonia and Ella waited curiously to see what it would look like. Moments later, Tan stepped out, dressed in an extravagantly beautiful ensemble. Ella gasped in awe the moment she saw him. Tan turned to Salonia and asked what she thought of it. Salonia, who had initially assumed the outfit wouldn't suit Tan since it was tailored for the crown prince, found herself pleasantly surprised. Now, seeing him dressed like this, she told him that it's all right. Wait, that's it? As she reflected, she realized how Ella had met men like Ian, Lyaf, and even Ryan, widely regarded as the most handsome men of the century. Yet, despite all that, Ella had been instantly captivated the moment she saw Tan. Salonia admitted to herself that she had never expected him to look this striking, and the outfit truly suited him, almost as if it had been made for him from the start. 
Verandi grinned and asked Salonia what she thought. Salonia stood up, gave her a nod, and instructed Verandi to add the outfit to her bill, much to the businesswoman's delight. Just then, someone walked into the shop asking for Verandi. It was none other than the bitchy Grace. She gave Salonia a fake smile and asked if she was there to pick out a nice dress. Salonia nodded and casually added that she assumed Grace was there to order one too. Grace confirmed, mentioning she had an important event coming up where she'd need a dress. Salonia couldn't help but think that Grace only came by to rub it in that she was marrying Ian. Grace then started praising Verandi, saying she'd heard how talented she was and wanted a special dress made. At that moment, Verandi spoke up, reminding her that the boutique only worked by reservation and she was already booked up. Grace, clearly irritated, snapped, asking if Verandi even knew who she was talking to. Ryan, who had been standing by, tried to calm her down. Realizing she was slipping into her usual bitchy behavior, Grace quickly shifted, trying to act all sweet and suggested they just find another store. What an absolutely disgusting sight to behold. Ryan then looked over at Salonia and asked if she could put in a good word for Grace with Verandi. Salonia was stunned at how bold he was being. He continued, saying Grace had always dreamed of having a dress made here, and she could help for old time's sake. Salonia couldn't believe what she was hearing. The woman he supposedly liked was ordering a dress for her wedding to another man. And on top of that, he was asking her, of all people, to help him make it happen. And this was after he had the nerve to say he wanted nothing to do with her. With a cold expression, Salonia told him she wasn't sure why Grace even needed her help, since Ryan always seemed to get whatever he wanted. She then told him to go ahead and try again, just like he always did. Grace was taken aback by Salonia's words. Undeterred, Ryan pressed her, insisting it wouldn't be difficult for her to help Grace. Just then, Tan arrived and questioned why Ryan was pushing her so hard when she clearly didn't want to assist. Ryan, shocked by Tan's tall stature, flinched and asked who he was, then tried to shove him aside, insisting he wasn't talking to him. Tan, fed up, grabbed Ryan by collar, causing everyone to gasp. He asked if Ryan had a death wish. Ryan gritted his teeth, ready to retaliate with his dragon energy, but to his astonishment, Tan effortlessly subdued all his power without lifting a finger. Salonia quickly stepped in, telling Tan that was enough. He reluctantly released him. Ryan, seething with rage, began to unleash his dragon's blue energy, preparing to attack Tan. Sensing the dangerous attack, Salonia intervened again, urging Ryan to calm down and questioning if he really intended to use his powers on a civilian. Ryan jolted at her words, confused as to why Salonia was defending Tan and labeling him a normal civilian. After all, Tan had just effortlessly erased Ryan's symbol of holiness, his dragon energy. He could feel Tan's dark, powerful energy was familiar, sparking a sense of dread. Salonia insisted Ryan back off, reminding him that he was a hero and shouldn't harm innocents. She realized that Ryan hadn't grasped who Tan truly was, and she needed to separate the two before their true selves were revealed. Ryan then turned and began to leave, but before exiting the store, he told Tan that he will remember him. Grace also took her leave, but Salonia stopped her before she could. She approached her and told her to not expect to be treated like a savior, just because she's with them, as she will only disappoint herself. If she had her own achievement, she's sure people will recognize her for it, and she won't need anyone's help to get her dress and any sane person would understand that Salonia's words are genuine and would take her advice honestly, even without showing her that she cared. But Grace was like, nah, bitch, that ain't happening here. She shot back by questioning her if it's not same for her, since she would have also been nothing if she wasn't born in Besson family. Salonia stepped forward, mentioning that she's correct, she didn't choose the family she was born into. However, she can prove herself even without her family name, as she have another name called Savior, that she earned through fair and square means. And well, this argument was out of syllabus for her, so she decided to get lost. Later, as Salonia arrived at her mansion, she inquired with Tan, why'd he stand up for her? As he's not her bodyguard, Tan replied by questioning if Ryan was one of the savior who betrayed her. Salonia was momentarily startled as she thought he regained his memory when he mentioned the saviors. Tan further inquired if she wanted him to get rid of that annoying dragon brat. As he'll do whatever she wants him to do, Salonia was shocked upon hearing the words coming out from his mouth. She thinks that he seemed to have changed, but also not at the same time. She smiled and assured him that it's all right, as things between her and that annoying dragon brat are already finished. As they began to move inside the mansion, Tan suddenly felt a presence behind him. He looked at it, but couldn't find anything. Later at Bennett Manor, Grace anxiously waited, pacing back and forth. A white magic circle soon appeared, and a man emerged from it, bowing deeply before her. Grace wasted no time and immediately asked if there were any updates, but the man informed her that he had yet to receive any orders. 
furious, Grace questioned whether he was even doing his job properly and demanded to know how much longer she would have to tolerate Salonia's conceited attitude while enduring such humiliation. She commanded him to relay the message that her patience had run out. The man nodded and disappeared just as quickly as he had arrived. Alone in the room, Grace clenched her fists, seething with frustration. How could Salonia remain so proud when everything had been stripped from her? Grace couldn't understand it. In her mind, if it weren't for Salonia's family connections, she would never have been able to obtain the title of savior. Her resentment grew, especially as she sat in silence, her thoughts turning to the mysterious man she had seen with Salonia. He was far more handsome than Ian and clearly stronger than Ryan, which sparked her curiosity. Grace's thoughts were interrupted when a maid entered the room, announcing that Ian had requested a meeting. Shocked by his sudden appearance, Grace thought to herself that even though Ian was her fiancé, he couldn't just show up unannounced. He needed to respect her space and inform her ahead of time. Quickly composing herself, she instructed the maid to clean up the room and bring him in. Soon, Ian sat before Grace, casually mentioning that he had heard about her encounter with Salonia the previous day. Grace calmly confirmed it, but brushed off the event as insignificant. Ian reassured her not to worry about what Salonia said, reminding her that while Salonia may be the daughter of Duke Besson, she had no right to mistreat his fiance. Grace nodded, replying that she already knew that well, and added softly that Ian's love for her was all she needed. Ian then casually asked Grace why her room looked different every time he visited. Grace smiled, explaining that she had changed the curtains and added new decor to freshen up the atmosphere. She then asked if he liked the changes. Ian glanced around the room, though he couldn't help but think about their family's strained finances. In his mind, all these extravagant additions seemed unnecessary, and he made a mental note to teach Grace about financial management if they ever got married. Trying to shift the conversation, Ian asked if she would like to go on a date with him. Grace flinched at the question, clearly caught off guard, and asked for clarification. Ian clarified that it was for their upcoming wedding, expressing his desire to marry as soon as possible so she could start learning how to manage his household and spend more time with his family. Grace, however, gently told him that there was no need to rush things, adding that every moment she spent with him was precious. Later, at the Besson Manor, Tan came to see Salonia for his usual recovery session. Concerned, Salonia asked if he was feeling all right. Tan replied that he needed more time to fully heal. Salonia, sensing his discomfort, commented that he must still be in a lot of pain, to which Tan only averted his gaze. He's just enjoying this, isn't he? Curious, Salonia then mentioned hearing that he had been spending time reading with Ella lately. She inquired about what they had read today. Tan, slightly embarrassed, replied that it was a story about a man and woman overcoming their differences in status and falling in love. Salonia raised an eyebrow in disbelief, surprised that Ella would recommend a romance novel to Tan. He then asked how humans obtained titles. Salonia explained that titles were often awarded for significant contributions on the battlefield or for great achievements, like defeating a demon lord. Tan's gaze sharpened at the mention of the Demon Lord, and Salonia quickly added that the war had ended long ago and the Demon Lord was no more, so that option wasn't available. With a hint of regret, Tan remarked that it's a pity, as he would have killed the Demon Lord if he was still alive. Salonia informed Tan that the next day, she would be attending the birthday banquet of Marcus Den Roja's daughter and planned to leave early in the morning, so he wouldn't be able to join her for breakfast. To her surprise, Tan calmly told her that he would accompany her to the event. Shocked, Salonia explained that only invited guests could attend banquets hosted by nobles and reminded him that he still lacked much common knowledge about social gatherings. And it turned out she wasn't wrong because he doesn't know what common knowledge is. He then curiously asked if she knew his age since she always spoke to him so formally. Salonia replied that it was just a habit, explaining that his appearance made him seem older than he probably was. As the conversation wound down, Salonia yawned, clearly exhausted. She inquired if Tan was feeling better and gently suggested that he could leave if his wounds had healed. However, Tan quickly responded, saying that his injuries still hurt. Without another word, Salonia leaned against his shoulder, much to his surprise. As he looked at her peaceful, sleeping face, a strange, unfamiliar emotion stirred in him. Without thinking, Tan gently pulled her hand toward him and kissed it softly for the very first time. In that brief, quiet instance, he found himself wishing that this night could last forever. The scene shifts to Archduke Hirschbrook's castle in the north. He mentions there's still no sign of activity at the Demon Lord's castle and admits he's unsure what to make of it. He wonders aloud if the strange energy he's sensing could be coming from a leftover monster. Kelvin responds that if that's true, it means the Demon Lord's power is growing stronger by the day. The Archduke agrees, adding that it must be their master's energy, but he's hesitant to fully believe it since the castle remains deserted. 
he points out that if the Demon King were still alive, he surely would have sought them out by now. Three months ago, when the human warriors stormed the castle, their Demon King ordered all the demons to flee. Though they wanted to stay, they had no choice but to follow his command. Little did they know, that would be the last time they saw him. Unlike monsters, demons draw their strength from the Demon Lord. His survival is essential to theirs. As the Archduke left the castle, he felt a deep sense of loss, as if their existence had been wiped out. They barely escaped to a human city, seizing human bodies to blend in. Since then, they've been suffering in the human world, enduring the hardships of human life. Even in his human form, the Archduke can still feel the presence of the Demon Lord's energy, and it can only mean one thing. His return is close. He then tells Kelvin that it's time to head to the capital, where they are sensing the source of their Demon Lord's power. At the banquet hall of Denroja's manor, Lady Nenya greeted Salonia, expressing her honor at meeting her. Salonia wished her a happy 10th birthday, which brought a bright smile to Nenya's face. Nenya then revealed that among all the saviors, Salonia is the one she admires the most, sharing that her story is her favorite. Curiously, she asked if the Demon Lord truly had a handsome face. Taken aback, Salonia redirected the conversation, urging Nenya to accept the gift she had prepared for her. It was a small pendant containing healing light. Salonia explained that while it was small, she hoped it would protect Nenia in her time of need. Nenia gratefully accepted the gift, but then her curiosity shifted to the man beside Salonia, who had been watching her intently. Salonia quickly clarified that he was her bodyguard. Although Tan wasn't on the guest list for the banquet, her father had allowed him to attend in that role. Salonia realized her father seemed unusually generous toward Tan and wondered if it was wise to leave him alone like that, considering he hadn't caused any issues so far. Just then, a lady approached Tan, introducing herself as Flower Blonde, the daughter of Count Blonde. Without hesitation, Tan told her to get lost, and she complied, aesthetically dashing away from him. Tan stood in the corner of the banquet hall, pondering whether this might be the reason Salonia didn't want him at the event. Just then, Ella approached, her expression curious, and questioned why he was all alone and where Salonia was. Tan replied that she was still busy meeting guests and suggested she wait with him until Salonia returned, Suddenly, Tan shifted the conversation and asked Ella how old he looked in her eyes. Ella considered for a moment before saying he appeared older than 20, somewhere around 25. This response triggered a memory for Tan. Salonia had mentioned that she was 21 years old. That meant they were four years apart. He recalled reading in a novel the day before that a four-year age gap between a couple is ideal, leading him to conclude that there was no need to think further about it. Tan then wondered aloud how much longer Salonia would take. Ella explained that it was her first appearance in nobility since her recovery, and everyone was eager to greet her. Tan had little interest in human parties filled with ostentation, but he couldn't help but notice how even the most painfully extravagant decorations and lights seemed beautiful as long as Salonia was there. Just then, he noticed a young man leaning in, kissing Salonia's hand. Tan's expression darkened at the sight. He questioned Ella about the guy, and when she looked over, she informed him that Lady Salonia was being greeted by a young lord. Suddenly aware of Tan's anger, Ella quickly grabbed him and whispered that it was just a formal greeting among nobles, and not what he might think. Before Tan could respond, they heard a familiar voice behind them. Ian appeared, wearing an arrogant expression, and questioned why Tan was there, asserting that the party certainly didn't suit someone like him. Grace stepped forward next, looking directly at Tan. She asked if he remembered her, as if they had only seen each other for a brief moment. Ian suddenly intervened, stopping Grace as she spoke. He remarked that no matter how much someone dressed up or attended these events, it didn't change their background, implying there was no need for her to speak so respectfully to Tan. He then turned toward Tan, asking if he didn't hear him. But before he could finish, Ian suddenly halted, noticing something unusual. He couldn't believe the overpowering energy radiating from Tan, a presence he hadn't expected. Just then, Marquis Den Roja arrived, expressing gratitude to Ian for coming despite his busy schedule. Ian replied that his work wasn't as important as Lady Nenia's birthday. Grace chimed in, greeting the Marquis and introducing herself as Grace Benet, daughter of Baron Benet, while thanking him for inviting them. But the Marquess outright ignored her, focusing solely on Ian. As he walked away with Ian, Grace was left behind, standing alone. Meanwhile, after greeting all the nobles, Salonia finally took a breath. Ella offered her a drink, which Salonia gladly accepted. Tan, who had been waiting, suddenly asked Salonia where he was. Salonia, confused, asked for clarification. Tan explained that he was referring to the man who had kissed her hand earlier, asking about his whereabouts. Realizing what Tan meant, Salonia calmly explained that it was just a normal greeting in high society. 
where it was good manners for a man to gently kiss a woman's knuckles. Tan, still not fully satisfied, leaned in close to her and asked if this greeting was only for nobles, since they hadn't greeted each other that way. Salonia explained that it wasn't compulsory unless the other person expected it. In the bustling banquet, Ian conversed with the Marquis, while Grace, left on her own, watched everything from the sidelines. She had assumed Ian would be the center of attention at the event, yet Tan managed to attract attention without even doing anything. She couldn't help but wonder who Tan really was, and where he had come from. Grace then approached Tan and Salonia, greeting them with a cheerful tone. Salonia, with a poker-faced expression, asked if Grace had any business with her since they had already exchanged their greetings earlier. Grace, undeterred, mentioned that Salonia still seemed cold toward her and suggested that she understood if Salonia disliked her. Before Grace could continue her rambling, Salonia cut her off, stating that there must be some kind of misunderstanding. Salonia clarified that she was only going to say this once. She wasn't interested in Grace enough to dislike her, as that's typically how people feel about strangers. She added that it was no different from how everyone else here felt about her. Salonia then told Grace that she didn't need to worry about her anymore, and if there was anything that needed to be discussed, it would be with Ian, not her. Upon hearing this, the nobles around them began to gossip and trash talk Grace, questioning how she could show her face with such confidence after stealing another girl's fiancé. With that, Salonia took her leave, with Tan accompanying her. Just as they departed, a man approached Grace and informed her that someone wished to see her in the annex. Grace quietly left the hall with him, a sight Salonia caught out of the corner of her eye. Suddenly, the Marquis announced to all the nobles that he had prepared a rare spectacle for them and advised everyone to gather in the garden. Salonia, however, felt that she had finished greeting all the important people and thought it best to leave before Tan and Ian had another confrontation. She instructed Ella to inform her father that she would be leaving early, and Ella quickly agreed. As Salonia and Tan walked through the corridor, she noticed there wasn't a theatrical troupe or band in sight. She wondered about the spectacle the Marquess had mentioned. Suddenly, Tan halted. Salonia, sensing something was off, asked what was wrong. Tan responded by asking if she couldn't hear the sound. Taken aback, Salonia replied that she didn't hear anything. Tan, with a serious expression, insisted that he definitely heard something, something wailing. Meanwhile, Ian was searching for Salonia. As he moved through the banquet hall, he suddenly spotted her in front of him. Just as he was about to approach her, he halted, noticing something strange. Salonia was holding Tan's hand, her expression serious and focused on him. Ian couldn't help but wonder why she was looking at Tan that way. Could the ridiculous rumors he'd been hearing actually be true? A little later, a group of ladies gathered nearby, openly admiring Tan's striking appearance. They gushed over his handsome face and chiseled features, saying they had never seen a man as good-looking in the entire empire. Ian, who had been within earshot but hidden from view, listened to their conversation. One lady mentioned that Tan was Salonia's knight, and that the duke trusted him greatly. Another added that they made a good pair together. Ian was stunned as he overheard this, but due to the distance, he misheard part of their conversation and believed that Salonia and Tan were already in a relationship. In the present moment, Ian approached Salonia and asked if something was wrong. Salonia quickly blocked him from coming any closer and asked why he cared, advising him to continue on his way. Ian explained that he had only come over because she seemed to be in an uncomfortable situation and questioned whether the man, Tan, wasn't acting suspicious. Salonia, however, sharply replied that it was none of his business. Despite her cold tone, she was secretly glad Ian had come, as she had never seen him act like this before. Just then, the Marquis made his grand entrance and ordered his servants to unveil the spectacle he had prepared for the guests. But at that moment, something strange happened to Tan. He suddenly heard a voice telling him that he needed to gather energy, and once he could see, something significant would happen. Confused and startled, Tan wondered what was going on as a strange voice echoed in his mind, and unknown memories started flooding into his thoughts. He began to question whether these were the memories he had forgotten. It turned out that the specter the Marquis had prepared was a real monster. The Marquis reassured everyone not to panic, claiming the cage was too strong for the creature to break out of, no matter how aggressive it was. Salonia wondered how the Marquis managed to capture a Garum, a creature as powerful as it looked, and one that had been extremely difficult to defeat during their expedition. Subduing it without holy power seemed impossible. As she was about to warn the Marquis of the danger, Ian told her that he would handle it himself and that she should focus on Scared Guy besides her. Confident that Ian could deal with the monster, Salonia agreed to check on the situation after being sent back to the carriage. She then told Tan they should leave, but to her horror, she realized his mind was elsewhere. She feared the monster's energy might be affecting him, 
possibly awakening something in him. Meanwhile, Ian approached the cage and informed the Marquis that he was familiar with Garum's and would keep watch just in case. He asked a servant to bring him a sword, which the servant quickly did. The Marquis reassured everyone once more, saying they had a savior among them, so there was no need for concern. The Marquis smirked, thinking that even the Emperor had never seen such a large monster. With Ian present, word would spread throughout the Empire that House Denroha was not only protected by a savior, but also possessed a powerful creature. Just then, Ella arrived and asked Salonia why she was still there. Without hesitation, Salonia ordered Ella to take Tan back to the carriage. Tan remained silent. Suddenly, the Garum broke free from the cage. Ian quickly instructed everyone to stay behind him and ordered the guards to escort the guests out. He felt something unusual about the Garum. To his surprise, the monster lunged directly at the sword he was holding. Ian attacked it, but the sword barely scratched the creature. He wondered if Garum's always had skin this tough. The monster then turned toward Nenia and lunged at her. Before it could strike, Salonia hit the creature with a spell, drawing its attention. As the monster approached her, she stood still, seemingly frozen in place. Ian asked what she was trying to do, but before the creature could attack, Ted stepped in, swiftly cutting the monster in half and pulling Salonia into his arms. Are you all right? Tan asked, and Salonia confirmed she was fine, though she asked him to put her down. Tan, however, lifted her up and asked if she felt unwell, pointing out that her face was flushed and her heart was racing. Embarrassed, Salonia urged him to at least put her down. Ho ho, she's soft. Just then, a butler approached and inquired if Salonia was unharmed. He informed her that the Marquess had taken Lady Nenya elsewhere and expressed his thanks on the Marquess's behalf. The butler also thanked Tan for saving Salonia, and Tan simply nodded. Salonia couldn't help but notice how different Tan seemed from his usual self. As she later made her way back to Besson Mansion, Salonia reflected on the situation, wondering what the Marquis had been thinking. Things could have gotten much worse. She also realized that soon, many people would hear about how Tan had killed the monster, and she wished he could have stayed out of the spotlight. Tan then revealed that the monster's thoughts had crept into his mind during the fight. When Salonia asked for more details, he realized that no one else, including her, had heard what he did. Confused, Tan asked Salonia why he was different from other people. He wanted to be like her and asked her to tell him everything she knew. The next day, Salonia saw that an article about Tan had already been published. She expected this, but didn't feel the need to worry about it just yet. Salonia decided to visit Weeklander's store because the night before, she had received a letter from him stating that he had found the books on the magical circle she had asked about. However, something about the letter felt off. It was written in a way that only someone aware of the conversation between Ella, Weeklander, and herself could fully understand, and it seemed intentionally vague regarding the sender and the subject. Just then, Ella arrived and asked if Salonia had read everything. Salonia nodded, thinking that the stories about Tan wouldn't be a problem. Ella slid a paper across the table and advised her to take a look at it. As Salonia read it, she was shocked by its contents. The report stated that a large fire had broken out in the Magic District shopping area, causing injuries and casualties among the residents and destroying several stores. Meanwhile, at the Imperial Palace, the Emperor summoned the Marquess. He asked if the Marquess understood the gravity of his actions, even though no lives had been lost. The Marquess was told his punishment would only be a hefty fine, which he accepted. The Emperor then asked who had defeated the monster. The Marquess replied that the person responsible was staying at Duke Besson's manor and was known as the Beast of the Night. Hearing this, the Emperor recalled that Ian had also been present, but the one who killed the monster was the Beast of the Night, a man from the slums. Intrigued, the Emperor decided he would meet this man sometime in the future. Later, Salonia arrived at Weeklander's store, only to be horrified by the sight of its destruction. She learned from the people nearby that, tragically, Weeklander hadn't survived the fire. Salonia couldn't help but wonder if this was truly an accident, especially since it happened just after she received his letter and planned to visit him. As she stood there lost in thought, someone approached her from behind, asking if she was all right. Salonia turned to find a young man and immediately inquired about his identity. Later, as she sat with him, she discovered he was Henrik, Weeklander's apprentice. Henrik revealed that Weeklander was a sage. Salonia was shocked, as sages were only mentioned briefly in the novel, described as beings with the ability to read minds and foresee the future through deep insight. Henrik then explained that his master had entrusted him with an item meant for her. When Salonia asked for clarification, Henrik slid a book toward her. He explained that Weeklander had known she would visit the store today and had instructed him to make sure she received this book on his behalf. Salonia was horrified by this revelation. Henrik confirmed her suspicions, saying that it seemed Weeklander had foreseen the entire incident. Salonia thought to herself that this was no ordinary accident. 
She questioned why Weeklander hadn't left the store, even though he knew what was going to happen. Henrik replied that his master always believed everything must follow its natural course. If anyone tried to interfere too hastily, it could plunge the present into chaos. Though Henrik found it difficult to fully understand his master's intentions, he was sure that Salonia too must have seen something like that in her own experience. As Salonia began to leave, she found herself pondering what vision of the future Weeklander had seen that made him believe it was unchangeable, and why he had urged her to take care of her health. She realized that she couldn't just sit idly by, waiting for someone else to get hurt. Whatever the future held, she was determined to stop it, no matter the cost. Meanwhile, at Baron Bennett's manor, a maid named Jamie inspected a batch of tea leaves, questioning if they were really Darjeeling. The other maid scolded her, telling her not to act clever or play tricks, but Jamie insisted she wasn't joking. She genuinely believed the leaves weren't Darjeeling. The second maid reminded her that they needed to send the leaves to Ian, Ryan, and Leia by the end of the day. If they were late, they might as well kiss their jobs goodbye. Undeterred, Jamie asked if the rumors about people being dragged to the basements were true. The other maid quickly warned her to never speak of that again, and urged her to hurry as they needed to finish before Grace arrived. Later, as Salonia went through the documents, she realized it was a personal record containing detailed information on a magic circle, something that couldn't be found in an ordinary book. Before the development of magical artifacts, sheepskin paper was often used as a medium for magic. There are three scenarios where a person's name and a magic circle would be written together. Teleportation magic to travel between locations, transmission magic to send objects, and communication magic for correspondence. All three forms of magic required either a destination or a recipient, so the name of a place or person had to be written below the magic circle. Salonia began to suspect that Jillian might be working for Grace, which would explain the seemingly meaningless information he had been feeding her about Grace. But could it be true? Gillian was the deputy chief of the Finest Guild, a guild run by the Besson family, and there were limits to what he could do under their watch. How had he managed to hide this from her father? Then, a troubling thought entered her mind. Could her father, like the main character, have fallen under Grace's influence? Suddenly, Salonia stood up, reminded that Gillian would soon be arriving for his regular report. She decided to set a trap to catch him in his deceit. After a while, she knocked on the door and called for Tan. As she considered whom she could trust in the manor, ironically, Tan came to mind first, even though she didn't have anything particular to discuss with him. When she entered the room, she found it empty. She wondered where he had gone, especially since she hadn't heard anything about him leaving at this hour. Then her eyes drifted toward his bedchamber, and she recalled what had happened before. She began to wonder if perhaps his pain had returned. As Salonia reached the door and called out to Tan, he suddenly emerged, grabbed her hand, and pinned her against the wall. Embarrassed, Salonia wondered what he was trying to do, but Tan quickly instructed her to be quiet, saying someone was coming. Just then, several maids entered the room and remarked that it was good Tan had left the mansion early that morning. Other maids suggested they should place their items quickly and leave. Once they were gone, Salonia asked Tan if he could step aside. She then inquired how he had known someone was coming. Tan explained that the maids had been acting as if they were watching him for the past few days. So, he pretended to leave the manor and then secretly returned to his room. Salonia was surprised by how well he had planned this, but she couldn't shake her curiosity about what the maids might have put in the room while he was away. Her gaze fell on a wardrobe in front of her. When she opened it, she was shocked to find some of her own jewelry inside. She wondered if this was an attempt to make it seem like someone had stolen them. What could be the motive behind such a scheme? Suddenly it dawned on her. Someone was trying to create a rift between her and Tan, wanting him to leave the manor. Salonia turned to Tan and told him someone was trying to frame him to get him kicked out. She assured him she would take care of everything. Tan looked puzzled and asked for clarification. He thought it would be better for her if he got kicked out sooner. Hearing this, Salonia turned to him, stating she would never want that to happen to him. But for some reason, she struggled to express her feelings. Trying to shift the conversation, Salonia said it was dinner time, and Tan grinned, agreeing. Meanwhile, word spread among the maids that there was a thief in the manor. Just then, Tan and Salonia appeared and asked what was wrong. One of the maids revealed that another maid claimed her jewelry was missing. At that moment, Rubé was made his entrance, asking Salonia if she needed him. Salonia realized he had clearly been waiting for this moment. She told him that one maid was saying her belongings had gone missing. Rubé was grinned and remarked that it sounded like a petty thief had entered the manor. Meanwhile, the scene shifted to Grace, who asked Ian if he thought the brooch suited her. Ian, with an uninterested expression, replied that she looked good in it. Inwardly, he reflected on how, after meeting Grace, he had stopped thinking about Salonia. But ever since seeing her with Tan, those thoughts kept stirring in his mind. 
he believed that Tan was no good for someone like Salonia, and that he should take her back. Grace, sensing something was off, noticed that Ian was acting strangely. He used to get flustered and cling to her at the slightest hint of her sulking. She wondered what had changed. A thought crossed her mind. Perhaps he was upset because she kept avoiding the subject of marriage. Smiling, she asked Ian if she could visit his house tomorrow. Ian, surprised, asked why all of a sudden. Grace responded that she would like to keep the previous two dukes company, to which he casually agreed. Grace was taken aback by how easily he agreed. She wondered if this was part of some game plan, or if he thought she would start clinging to him. But she resolved that this wouldn't happen. She would keep Ian as her trophy, especially since there was now a new man in the picture. The scene shifted to the Besson Manor, where the Duke inquired if something was wrong. Salonia replied that she suspected a thief had broken into the manor. The Duke asked what made her think that. Just then, Rubé was chimed in, stating that the servants of the palace were well aware of the Duke's generous consideration and welfare, but there was one who seemed an exception. He continued, suggesting that it was too late to search all the rooms thoroughly and proposed checking Tan's room, as he seemed the most plausible culprit. Tan, however, confidently chuckled at the accusation, much to Rubewus's shock. Later, as the servants began to search Tan's room, one of them called out that he had found something. Rubewus grinned and remarked that he had suspected as much, mentioning that he had heard Tan frequented vulgar places and that his background was catching up with him. As Rubewus stepped closer to examine the find, he declared that he would punish Tan himself for all the jewels he had stolen and kick him out. However, eh? when he saw that it was only a single brooch, he questioned, What is this? as he clearly told them to gather everything. Upon hearing this, the Duke asked Rubewus what he meant and urged him to continue. Salonia then took the brooch and revealed that she had given it to Tan, challenging Rubewus on how he knew it belonged to her, and how he was aware of jewelry she had never lost. Rubewus stammered, trying to explain that he was being framed. He accused Tan of setting this up out of spite and demanded that Tan tell the truth. However, Tan merely feigned ignorance. Gritting his teeth, Rubewus demanded how Tan dared to use him to win over Salonia and charged at him. Tan quickly turned and grabbed him by the jacket. The duke intervened, stating that this was enough. He announced that he was removing Rubewus from his position as captain of the Order of Knights. Salonia instructed the servants to find the maids whom Rubewus had bribed, vowing to handle them personally. Rubewus then turned to Salonia, questioning why she was so generous toward Tan. She replied that she hadn't been generous to anyone. She reminded him that she had offered him another chance out of respect for his loyalty, but he had landed himself in this predicament. Later, as Salonia and Tan walked down a corridor, Salonia expressed her relief that everything had gone according to plan. Tan asked her what she would do now. Salonia turned to him and reminded him that it was midnight and they should meet again later. Tan smiled and agreed. She advised him to ensure that no one saw him, and Tan nodded in understanding.